This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Three minutes after 10 is the time. A very good morning to you. The Mayor of London is here, um, equipped with uh, all the latest technology, which means that he'll be able to introduce the calls himself. And in fact, I won't. I, oh, yes, I will. Um, uh, so I'll put him in charge of that shortly. But I need to begin with something that I, I don't really like talking about. I have a rule. I don't know if you've ever picked up on this. You're, the only time we discuss motoring issues on this programme is when you're here. Okay. I try to sort of swim against the tide of radio phone in traditions when sure. you can fill hours with talk of potholes and parking tickets and, and the rest of it. And of course, latterly, you let's. But as someone who travels almost exclusively by public transport, I can't get anywhere at the moment. I, I really can't get anywhere. The roads across the entire capital. I just to, to be specific, and this is why I don't really like it as a subject. But if you're trying to get to the station at Boston Manor or Northfield at the moment, the bus stops about a half a mile away from the station because of all the roadworks. If you're coming from Brentford into Central London, it's like it's, it's, there's more chicanes than there are at Brands Hatch. What is going on, and how much of it is your fault? So, so the way it works is uh, good morning, James. Is uh, the, <laughs> good morning. The, the utility company. Uh, for TFL roads pay a lane rental charge. And so for TFL roads, and just a reminder, only 5% of roads in the city, 5% are TFL controlled. So we are very good at coordinating. And the rest are controlled by the local council. Exactly. So, so you, you have responsibility for 5% correct. of London roads. Right? Correct. Okay. So we coordinate. So for example, if you're the, the gas company wants to dig up roads, we'll say, by the way, before you do, does the electricity company want to dig up roads? Does the 4G, 5G company want to dig up roads? And we coordinate. So there's only one digging up of roads uh, to, that doesn't cause you inconvenience, and we charge for each day that roads dug up. What we're trying to do is to have a similar scheme for council roads, coordinating those disturbances, because as you say, they affect uh, buses in particular, they affect cars and so forth. So we are working with councils, working with the utility companies to reduce the amount of disruption you talk about. Well, it's not working, is it? Well, I mean, to give, to give councils... Why, why is it so much worse than usual at the moment? It's, I, it's I think extraordinary. Every, it's probably the only thing on which everybody listening to this programme, in the capital, I apologise if you're listening in Blackpool, this isn't going to be at the top of your list of priorities. Uh, it's probably the only thing we could all agree on, is it has never felt this... But I, I'm in agreement with Jeremy Clarkson on this issue. Yeah. It's, it's extraordinary, the consensus that this is the worst it has ever been. And it's not just utilities, quite a lot of it is cycle lanes being built, being yeah. built, which of course causes disruption and delay. Well, where, where Blackpool... Blackpool residents will agree with you. Is also this an issue of potholes, and so the the government's also and this is you know the government's given councils additional money to address the issue of potholes, which they've got to spend by the end of the financial year. So there are a number of things culminating in, in the sort of distress you're uh, ex, uh, demonstrating. Uh, and by the way, this 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 is also felt by colleagues across the country as well. And that's why we need to have a system that's better coordinated. So you have just a road dug up once a year, a short period of time. The other frustration, James, is people see uh, roads blocked off and no work being undertaken uh, and that's why i think if you could charge a higher lane rental that would encourage people incentivize them to make sure you're working all around the clock to finish that uh, road work because it means that you you're not paying more money in rain lentils so we don't really know why things feel much worse than ever then at the moment things are much worse it, than it, ever. Just, it, it's just an aligning of planets is it a coincidence of of, of roadworks 90 uh, percent of uh, delays in roads are caused by road caused by roadworks and mm. so we've got to address the issue of roadworks uh, and we've got to make sure we're better with utility companies with council Councils and others. This is not just another problem. I hasten to add. Okie dokie. Um, on with the call. Okay. Good, good morning uh, to, to to your listeners as well. Uh, the first caller is from West London. I think it's Finlay from Ealing. Hi, hi Finlay. Good morning, James and Sadiq. How are you doing? Not bad, thank you. How are you? Okay. Very good, thanks. Um, my question is as follows: This week, the Tories are fighting with each other over the disastrous Rwanda policy. The Conservative candidate for mayor backs the policy, but I don't think someone who backs such an immoral, expensive and unworkable scheme is suited to the job of mayor. What do you think about the government's Rwanda policy? Well, that's a bit of a flippy softball for the opening question. Is anybody vetting this stuff? Extraordinary. Is this because you're picking them yourself now? Well, look, can I, can I do with this, the serious issue of, of, of the Rwanda policy, which uh, is really important I address Finlay. And it's really important that... That, that part for a second around a policy, uh, I'm somebody who does not believe in uncontrolled migration. I do not believe in an open doors uh, policy. There's got to be controlled migration. We've got to also make sure we don't conflate the issue of asylum seekers, refugees, with family reunion, with students, with work permits and so forth. Uh, and my anxiety, concern and anger about the Rwanda policy, it seems to be determined and dictated 
by the party interest, the Conservative Party interest, than the national interest. And I just remind you and other listeners that people who are fleeing persecution, are looking for a safe haven, what this Rana policy will mean is, even if they persuade the British government that they're a genuine refugee, they're a genuine asylum seeker, their future would be in Rwanda, not in uh, London or in this uh, country. And just looking back, just look back at the history of our city and our country, uh, the contribution made to our city and country by uh, refugees and uh, others. I think this policy is inhumane, it's immoral and it's uh, unworkable. But what we've seen over the last two weeks, though, Finlay, is a good example of a divided party, which, and, and I think they've come to the end of their time now. It's just a question of, um, you know, when, not if. Uh, they're booted out. We can't be complacent about the results of the next general election, but you know you've got a situation where we are being deflected by this Rwanda policy, just like a few years ago we were deflected by the the Brexit campaign and the Brexit policy. And I'm hoping you know Finlay cooler, calmer heads in the House of Lords uh, prevail. There, there was some astonishing polling from YouGov this week. I only saw it yesterday, uh, looking at where the British people think immigration comes from. I don't know if you saw it. 45% of all Britons believe that more people come here illegally than legally. 34% believe that more people come here legally than illegally. I I mean, it's it's so wrong that it is extraordinary on every level, both statistically and, I suppose, uh, intellectually. It's about about over 90% of people who come here come here legally. So the Rwanda policy almost seems to be designed to address this myth. Yeah, look, as a consequence of misinformation, mm. uh, another consequence of misinformation is people thinking wrongly uh, that council homes goes to, inverted commas, uh, foreigners or, or, or immigrants, or people thinking wrongly that the reasons why the NHS is struggling, the reason why schools are crumbling, the reason why there's not enough genuine affordable homes is because of the other uh, and by the way, it's the oldest trick in the in the book, James, as you know. Rather than you know addressing people's fears, you play on people's fears and you blame the other. In this case, the other is uh, people who have got no safe passage to come here and are therefore having to rely upon organised criminal gangs in France and uh, elsewhere. That's why, Phil, I think what the government should be doing is a number of things. Firstly, providing safe routes for people to, who you know, are genuinely fleeing persecution to come here. Secondly, address, uh, addressing the massive backlog of asylum uh, cases by employing more caseworkers, but also targeting those criminal gangs in France and, and, and you know, uh, across the Mediterranean. Uh, but politically speaking, do you understand how Rishi Sunak has ended up in such a mess on this issue? It's such a bizarre thing to have staked the house on, and, and, and yet... Here he is, sort of being torn apart, watching his own party tear itself to pieces over a policy that won't make much difference to anything in the unlikely event that it actually works. It's extraordinary politics. Well, the the, the reason why we're seeing this sort of politics is because he's weak. He's a weak man, uh, a weak leader, a weak prime minister. That's why. So he's throwing red meat to, you know, his backbenchers, uh, whether it's Lee Anderson or, or Jacob Brees, Mark, you know, governing in the party interest rather than the national interest, rather than, look, how does this policy address the issue of our junior doctors being on strike? How does this ish- address the issue of, of the huge waiting lists in the NHS? How does this issue address our crumbling uh, schools or the problems with getting a, a dentist uh, with the cost of living crisis? And it's it's classic deflection. Uh, you'll remember, uh, you know, the the... the, the, the polling expert, election expert used by uh, David Cameron. He mm-hmm. had this phrase of a dead cat. It's a good example. Look, you and I uh, spent the last five minutes because of Finlay's legitimate question talking about Rwanda and not the other crisis facing uh, our country. That's and that's what the point. government wants us to do. Well, let's crack on. Uh, Finlay, thanks, thanks for your call. The next question is from Brentwood and it's Shane. Good morning, Shane. Good, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, I work for a large housing association and I feel the majority of staff are decent and care but there's a deliberate and gross negligence by the directors and above. So what, what are you doing or what, what will you do to give like, these tenants who are often vulnerable a voice from like, what I would call egregious corporate behaviour? So, so Shane, uh, I, in a previous life, was a member of parliament uh, and before that was a councillor. Uh, and the advantage with uh, those who are tenants in council properties is we had some leverage to make sure the council sorted out the sort of issues you're raising. There's a big problem in relation to the lack of locus, the lack of influence, the lack of levers with those tenants in housing associations. So what I want the government to do is to have an ombudsman with teeth looking after the interest of those in social uh, housing, but also giving tenants like the ones you're describing powers to take action. At the moment, Shane, whether you're a local MP or a councillor, uh, it's very difficult to exert pressure 
on housing associations. By the way, there are some excellent housing associations. They've had a real problem over the last 14 years because of lack of investment. They're dealing with issues around, you know, the Grenfell Tower legacy, uh, you know, tall buildings, issues around uh, the built environment and uh, carbon emissions, but also mould and damp and so forth. And so some of them do great pieces of uh, work. Others, you're right, aren't being held to account. And given tenants those powers uh, and that ally on their side would lead to, I think, uh, housing associations that are less good raising their game. I, mean, I, I won't mention any names, but obviously no, there, there, was, um, there, there was a young boy who, who died in, in, in Rochdale. That's right. Because uh, um, of mould. There's been another one. You mentioned the housing ombudsman. They've ruled for one housing association where the tenant suicide was, was down to the housing association. I know you used to be a lawyer. What about corporate manslaughter charges? Could they be... Yeah, so unfortunately, so the, uh, uh, the ombudsman currently only uh, can only exert any power when there's maladministration, not poor service and all the rest of it and stuff. So the lim- very limited powers, very little uh, teeth. I'm afraid in this country, the, the law around corporate manslaughter isn't as strong as it is in, for example, in America. Uh, you will have heard other discussions over the last three, four weeks around the post office scandal. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and steps that could be taken against those responsible for, you know, what happened with, with that. I'm afraid in this country, uh, we haven't got the, the powers uh, citizens in the USA uh, have. So we're in my legal hat. What I'd want Parliament to do is to, you know, legislate to give more rights to uh, uh, tenants, uh, you know, social tenants in particular, uh, whether they're council tenants or t- housing associations. But also I want to extend those powers also to private tenants as well. I'm afraid, Shane, the issue of damp, mould, you know, rent's been increased, uh, you know, every few months is an issue for those li- who live privately as well. Generally speaking, uh, you know, those who are tenants in this country get a far worse service than those who are tenants across Europe and other parts of the world. I think that needs addressing. Why is that? I, I think what we saw uh, in the 1980s was a massive deregulation of the housing market without wishing to go back in, in relation to yeah. you know, Margaret Thatcher's legacy. That deregulation uh, meant that you had a situation where it was, you know, uh, a cowboy world when it came to a, a number of areas. You will know in relation to, for example, the Grenfell Tower, one of the reasons why, uh, you know, tenants weren't listened to or raised issues, the Resident Association was because of lack of re- regulation, councils marking their own uh, homework. And you see that across the piece. And so I'm afraid that deregulation wasn't fully rectified when there was the last Labour government. I'm hoping the next government, the next Labour government, rectifies the massive deregulation that led to the, the unlevel playing field. What, what percentage of former council homes do you think are now in private landlords' hands? A significant percentage. I've, I've got the number. Uh, uh, it's not, it's not a spot quiz. No. I'm just, I, just, I just couldn't believe so, my eyes. This uh, is from the, the, the House of Lords Library, but it must have come up in Parliament quite recently. It did, yeah. So I've, I've not got the number to hand. It's more uh, than forty percent yeah. of former council homes are now in the in the private rented sector. There's so th- it's not quite the revolution that that many fans of Margaret Thatcher still proclaim it to be, is it? There's a figure worse than that, which is which is for every six council homes sold off, only one was replenished. So there's okay. two things happen at the same time. One is you're reducing the amount of council housing uh, stock, uh, and that that those former council homes subsidised by the taxpayer are now owned by uh, people who then sublet it or they they let it uh, with a market value rent rather than a council rent and the stock hasn't been replenished. That's the reason for the housing crisis, not asylum seekers or mm. refugees or migrants or, and all the rest of it. What the government should be doing is addressing those issues by building uh, significant numbers of additional council homes by fixing the private rental market. Instead, we've got the Rwanda bill. Thank you for what you do, Shane. It sounds like you've, you've, you're getting it from all angles, but obviously without people like you in that sector, the situation for vulnerable tenants would be even worse. No, th- th- thank you, Shane. It is already. 10.16 is the time. On with the calls. Thank you, uh, Shane. The next caller is from South London, and it's uh, Sarah from Croydon. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning, Sadiq. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of my situation. Please, please. Um, so mid last year I was given a section twenty one. I was evicted and um the That's a no, a, a no fault eviction notice for yeah. people who for people who don't know. So you just got slung out of your home by the landlord. Yeah. Because he wanted uh, um to sell up. Okay. And um I was given an emergency accommodation by the council Um, Now, the thing is that being in emergency accommodation, I'm now in perpetual debt and poverty. Now, the reason for this is because, um, number one, I don't get universal credit. Even though I'm a single Uh, parent, uh, uh. I don't get universal credit. Um, 
my housing benefit that they said that I should pay. So the council is willing to pay only £9.98 <coughs> for me. Um, and it's £8,800 per month for just a room. I live with 15 other people. We um, There are only two toilets and one bathroom. Now, I have to wait to use the bathroom. I have to wait to cook. And because I can't do that constantly, I've had to sign up to the gym. There's no broadband at the house for me to do my work. So I'm paying more for, um, what is it, for Wi-Fi, for uh-huh. data. I, I, I spend lots of money on takeaway because I can't wait every single night to feed my child, who is six years old. Um, and before... I had 300 to 400 pounds left over for me to buy food and other essentials after my bill. Now, because of you, Les, and because I live so far, I'm spending that 300 and something pounds on you, Les. I have, so that means every single month I'm wiped out before I even start my month. I've got, um, for the first time in, what is it, over 15 years, I've now got an overdraft. Oh. I'm in perpetual overdraft and debt because I can't afford to feed myself, oh. feed my daughter, and even buy essentials. Right now, I'm waiting for payday just to buy milk. Who do I turn to if I can't get universal credit? People like me are left out of the equation because the council says to me, I earn too much. Universal credit says to me, I earn too much. But you've got you left that's come and taken over my taken my um, money that I had to buy these things. Now I don't have anything. Who am I to go to? Well, sir, sir, thanks for your call. Can I, can I deal with the various points you, you, you raise in the order you've raised them? So, so firstly, if the housing issue, secondly, benefits issue, thirdly, Euler's issue. So we, we have got a, a housing crisis across the country and, and the irony is we're spending more money in benefits than we are in bricks and mortar. You mentioned housing benefit and so forth. So what we should be doing is spending more on bricks and mortar, which would reduce the benefits bill that you uh, refer to. So the reason why you've got a gap between the money you receive from housing benefit and your rent is because the housing benefit has not increased with the rent uh, for a number of years because the government froze the amount of money that, that those in receive, receipt of housing benefit gets. Even though you're working, you've got a, you, you're entitled to housing benefit because the rent is so high and your, your salary compared to that is low. So that's one of the reasons why we've called to the government to lift the benefit caps that exist, lift the housing benefit caps that exist to support people like uh, you. The second issue you raised is in relation to um, uh, the temporary accommodation uh, 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 that, you, that you're in. So one of the reasons why many councils across the country are going bankrupt is because huge increases in their bills of temporary accommodation, social care and children services. And that's why we're supporting councils to buy properties already built that they can use to rehouse families rather than using temporary accommodation to reduce their bills. The third point you raise in relation to the ultra low emission zone is I'd encourage you to, we've now, we've now increased the, uh, the scrappage scheme so anybody in London, anybody in London, it used to be you had to earn below a certain level, but anybody is eligible now for the uh, scrappage scheme. 41,000 people have taken advantage of the uh, scrappage scheme. Many uh, have bought uh, new vehicles. And I'd encourage you to, after this call, go to the TFL website to see what you're entitled to in, re- in relation to your uh, car because that will reduce the pressures there are on you. Uh, the cost of living crisis is affecting many, many uh, people across the country, including in London. I'm desperately sorry for, for, for the plight you're facing. The no fault eviction that you were at the, rec- at the receiving end on is uh, the receiving end on is causing big problems across the, the country. We've said to the government they should end the Section 21 no fault uh, eviction. They should give tenants like you longer notice periods if you are being evicted but you should only be evicted if there's a good reason for a landlord to uh, evict you because what we're seeing i'm afraid is more and more uh, london has been evicted through section uh, 21 when the government promised three four years ago they would end that but you mentioned the um what is it the scrappy scheme mm. If for the scrappage scheme they only give you two thousand pounds two thousand pounds is not going to buy me a ulev car you're just complying, so with respect, I'm, it does. I'm already paying. I'm still. I still got three thousand pounds left on the card that I have. Yeah. So I. I don't know where I'm. What I'm supposed to do. I can't. I can't get a new car because I can't afford it. 
Yeah. So, so just, just I say in a respectful way, you, you can get a ULIS compliant card for the, the amount of money available in the scrapage scheme. I, I know this because many people have, but also we speak to those who show cars for uh, sale. For those who've got finance, I mean, I'm afraid you need to speak to your finance company on because I mean, different finance companies have different rules in relation to paying back the finance. What some people have chosen to do is to sell their vehicle because they get more money from that than they do from the uh, scrappage scheme. But but you can contact TFL who will give you advice in relation to the scrappage scheme and the eligibility. And just to reassure you that there are vehicles available that are ULES compliant with the money the scrappage scheme gives. But can I also ask, why is it that the, um, the government and the councils, um, what is it, waste money on housing people in temporary accommodation, especially people who can probably afford a mortgage but just don't have uh, um, a deposit? Yeah. Why waste money on temporary accommodation for certain people? Why is it not means tested? Maybe it's better for the council to give certain people deposits, knowing that they can get a mortgage. Yes, yeah, so and then they no longer become the council's problem. I, I, I agree with you. That's one of the reasons why I explained that the the irony in relation to the benefits bill versus bricks and mortar. So there is a scheme which we do and which others do uh, called. Um, uh, the, 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 the shared ownership scheme, which is part part mortgage, part rent. So your deposit required is far less than it otherwise would uh, be. So, so the normal deposit you need in London is you know circa thirty forty thousand pounds, which very few people have. If it's, even if it's five percent, with the shared ownership, uh, the mortgage is far less. The average is five thousand pounds, and and now some some mortgage companies are are offering um, mortgages with with a smaller deposit. You, you'll you'll have heard, I'm sure. Uh, Rachel Reeves last week talking about fixed term mortgages for 25 years to give people certainty uh, as they do in Europe. And that's one of the things that would help people like you, Sarah. But the irony is now the average cost to rent in London is £2,500. So if you were able to get on the property ladder, your mortgage, even with the increases caused by Liz Truss's kamikaze budget, would probably be less than the rent you pay in London and with a private landlord. So what are we advising Sarah to do then in, 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 relation in the context to, of all of the problems? In relation to uh, uh, housing, uh, uh, Sarah, I, I mean, the key thing is to obviously speak to the council and see what help they can give you. Also, what we've done uh, is we've provided financial support to CABs and to law centres. So it's worth just checking, Sarah, whether... Uh, whether through a CAB and law centre that we help fund, whether you can maximise your income because there may be benefits you're entitled to which you aren't receiving. Over the last couple of years, we've we've given lots of families in London additional income because of benefits they're entitled to that they're not, they're not receiving. And the third thing, uh, James, is to encourage Sarah to go to the TFL website to assist her because what I don't want is her having to pay the ULES charge when she simply can't afford to do so. So even if you ended up still owing money on the old car, you would be able to drive a car that didn't involve the ULES charge every day. Now, that, that's what yeah, so what happens, so, so it's what, what people have done uh, in, in London and those just outside London is to uh, sell off their vehicle, pay back their finance company, uh, which is, uh, and then they're not getting future, you, uh, you know, £12, £50 a day, which is the ULES uh, charge, or use a scrappage scheme, and with the money from the scrappage scheme, buy another vehicle that is ULES compliant. Some people haven't bought another vehicle, they've decided it, it, to. It, I mean, it's, it may not touch the sides of what you're going through at the moment, Sarah, but uh, quite a lot of people getting in touch to say, Andrew in Richmond, but my 18-year-old car is worth next to nothing, but it is ULES compliant. I mean, uh, quite a lot of people have been surprised to discover that their cars were not, yes. particularly people in Uxbridge and Yeah, so just, and to, just to remind colleagues that, that uh, generally speaking, generally speaking, a, a petrol car that's newer than 2005 is ULES compliant. A diesel car that's newer than 2015 is ULES uh, compliant. People think that we're going to buy an electric car or a hybrid car or a new car. That's not the case. Sarah, I wish we could do more. Well, the, the thing is that I know he said about the um, shared ownership, but if I'm in perpetual debt, how am I supposed to save for a deposit for that? That's, that, that's my thing. Mm. If I'm not getting extra money from elsewhere, how am I supposed to get myself out of this? Who am I supposed to go to? You know, th there's no government website that tells me that you can go to this if you've been denied um, universal credit. There's nothing like yeah, that. that, that uh, S S Sarah, I mean, I, I, I'd encourage you to go to the Citizens Advice Bureau and, and law centres. Because, because we know they're desperately overworked and understaffed, we've given them resources over the last couple of years and I announced in my budget this week we'll be giving those law centres an additional £4.2 million because they can help people who are really struggling but also they can advise them and they can signpost them 
to schemes and uh, funding available uh, to them because you're right, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a minefield in relation to seeing what benefits you're entitled to. I think the reality is for, for you know, in, in the short term, it's very difficult to, to support people because of the lack of council homes. One of the reasons why I'm really passionate about council homes and genuinely affordable homes is because it allows people like you who aspire to be a homeowner to pay submarket rents uh, so you can put money aside uh, to save up for a deposit in the uh, future because, you know, you're, you're living hand to mouth because you're, you've been paying a private rent, you know, a temporary accommodation. You simply can't put money aside each month to pay for a deposit. That's one of the reasons why actually council homes actually is a stepping stone towards uh, the aspiration many people have to be homeowners. So I, I, I wish you well. Um, we'll keep in touch. Uh, let you let us know how you get on with um, some of the organisations that the mayor has suggested that you, you speak to, but do hang in there. Um, time for at least one more call. Thank okay. you very much, Sarah, for your call and uh, best of luck in the future. The next caller is from Tower Hill and it's uh, Alex. Good morning, Alex. Hello. Hi, Sadiq. Hi. Yeah, I um, run an uh, organisation called Reform Political Advertising. Yep. We're a politically neutral, not-for-profit organisation campaigning for the House of Lords' recommendation for there to be uh, regulation for factual claims in electoral ads. Um, and we launched a code for factual accuracy in electoral advertising this week. And I just wanted to ask you a straight yes or no question about it. Um, the key point in, in the pledge that we're approaching um, parties and candidates in the mayoral election uh, to support is that in your election advertising this year, you're going to make every reasonable effort not to mislead voters, ensure that factual claims are accurate according to recognised sources, and acknowledge if you make a mistake and issue a public correction as quickly as possible. Uh, the Green Party have already signed up to this. Will you sign up to it too? This, well, is, this is Alex Tate, who was in the studio on Wednesday uh, from, from Reform Political Advertising, with a pretty straightforward question. Well, uh, Alex, I'm sure I'll, I'll ask my election agent to, to speak to you to see what we can do uh, in relation to that. C can you go back in time to 2016 during the Brexit campaign? Because that bus was a lie, wasn't it? Well, actually, there's, yeah, there's disinformation across all of our elections. Uh, we've been tracking them and we tracked the last mayoral election. It was particularly dirty, like we saw uh, Sean Bailey sending, uh, you know, fake letters with yeah. a made-up City Hall logo for Londoners and Brian Rose's antics. So, so uh, it's a real opportunity Alex, to listen, leadership. I, I, I mean, you know, really Alex, really I, of course I'm sympathetic. I've been on the receiving end, as, as you know, James knows, in elections, and you've just given another example of that. So, of course, I'm sympathetic to this. Uh, you know, I, 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 I probably get massive resignations from, from my election agent if I said yes on air, but of course we're sympathetic. And I'll make sure that my, my team speaks to you uh, to make sure we can we can sign up to this. I mean, my, my, only, my, my only anxiety, just speaking, speaking candidly with you, is, as I've always been straight in relation to not, not just my uh, election literature, but also as, as mayor in relation to what we are doing, we've got to have a level, level playing field, Alex, because what would be unfair is if I continue to be straight, candid and honest with Londoners, but my Tory opponent or others weren't. And so, of course, you, it's got to be right what you're saying. We've seen the consequence. James gave one example in relation to people's views on immigration. Um, of misinformation. So, of course, we can have, you know, factually accurate uh, information. And by the way, sometimes we can make an error, put your hands up and accept that an error has been uh, made and uh, uh, correct that. And so, uh, of course, I'm sympathetic, Alex. I'm going I'm to encourage my election agent to speak to you as soon as this call is finished. I'm going to keep an eye on this as well, because I don't quite buy that response, that the idea that you can't commit to being honest in case... I've, you... I've said I'm sympathetic. No, I've said no, I'm, I've, I've said, yeah, I've said I'm sympathetic. What you also said I've was you can't no, commit to it because no, the other lot might carry don't... on lying. Well, but well, the two on wrongs are never going to make a right, are we? Hold on a sec, uh, on. Uh, Alex. You know, uh, we've got to be, we've got to recognise that you know that the last two mayoral campaigns have seen the Tories fight dirty, yes. misinformation lies, and some would say racist and Islamophobic. Now, listen, I, I, I'm somebody who always has, try, has tried to fight campaigns that, that are markers of Queensbury, where my opponents, you know, use fight club rules. Uh, what I'm saying to Alex is, of course, I'm sympathetic to what you're talking about. Of course, I try and have high standards. Of course, I try and have altitude. But I'm 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 signposting Alex to my election agent in relation to pledges that have been signed up because what happens is you'll be aware. Uh, James, there'll be callers after callers between now and May the 2nd asking me to sign up to things. So yes, Alex, I'm sympathetic. And thank you, by the way, for the public service you are providing. Mm. And so I'll make sure my election agent speaks to you as soon as we finish this call. And, and we will um, stay in touch with Alex and make sure that you do get that he does get a full a full and frank response. I think the Conservative candidate's on on Monday, Alex. I, 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 I don't know whether you'll be able to get on and perhaps put the same question to her, but she's, she's on with Nick Ferrari on Monday morning. Yeah, yeah we, we ran it at the... Um so we asked a similar question to candidates on the last election, last mayoral election, 
I think maybe we're a bit late with Sadiq, but the Liberal Democrats and the Greens um, signed up to it, as well as um, well, seven candidates in total. Um, so, yeah, we'll definitely speak to you. No, next thanks, week. Alex. And th- th- thank you. I think Londoners would be quite disappointed if you can't commit so to the factually accurate in your election ads. It's a very simple ask. Yeah, no, thanks, Alex. And I'll make sure that my election agent speaks to you when we finish this uh, call. I've only got time for another caller. One we? more. Yeah, so the next caller is from... Th- thanks, Alex. The next caller is from Loughton, and it's uh, Tony. Good morning, Tony. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for taking Always my a pleasure. call. Always I've been a, a London cabby now for 44 years, proud and uh, distinguished, as you appreciate. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the word high standards in your last comment. Uh, it comes to light this week that you was uh, supporting a rally of uh, non-speaking requirements for minicabs to be endorsed into the minicab industry, whether it's Uber or minicabs in general. Now, I want to know why, with respect to you, sir, is the fact that why have you done this? Fundamentally, it's the most important thing, language, from driver to passenger, to go from A to B. And you've now just, uh, a stroke of a pen, suggested the £36 on the Siru situation is going to be abolished. Now, with respect to you, sir, why have you done this? Because if anyone gets into a minicab uh, and they want to go to, say, even Westminster Abbey, the driver might not even understand how to get there, let alone to speak English. Now, how can you make that decision, sir? Well, Tony, thanks for your call. Cool. Firstly, I've made no decision. What TFL are doing is reviewing the way they test people's competence to speak uh, English because what we've had examples of, TFL have, is examples of where people do speak very good English but are not very good at doing tests. So what TFL are doing, and I support TFL, is reviewing the method of testing uh, people to make sure it's uh, fair. I'm sure you'd support that. Listen, I mean, I understand the situation more than anyone else, being a London cabbie at the forefront of for 44 years mm. and seeing the political agenda that's gone on and the demise of the London Black Cab with the, you know, the uh, phasing out of the old TFX in the in them type of cabs. And then we've lost 3,000 drivers. And uh, the situation now, you've took three years off a of London cab that they shouldn't have been took off. And all these people now have gone from early retirement on when COVID was in. What's the, qu- what's the question, Tony, mate? Well, the, it leads on to another question. Well, know. no, we haven't got time for another question. What, what, you, right. you, what, what's the answer to the to the, well, the English? Why, no, I'm asking the mayor. What, so he says you've abolished the test. Has it been abolished? No, TFL haven't abolished the test. So, TFL are reviewing the method of testing people's uh, competence because right. people can speak great English, you know, Tony being a good example, and others may not be good at doing tests. And so what TFL are doing is reviewing okay. the way people are tested uh, and their English and so forth. So I, it, does that reassure you, Tony? Mr. Mayor, is the seven and a half thousand pound? Um, no, um, just on the th- question that you've rung in on. Are you, does, does that address your question? Well, it doesn't, with respect to you, James. So you I think understand. you think you think the mayor is misleading me now? It might be a vote winner. That's who I'm trying to say. That's I don't understand. I, I really want to help you out here because I, I, I don't understand. You've said it's been abolished. He says it hasn't been. It hasn't. Well, all right. well, in time will tell. Time oh, will tell. Oh, all right. Yeah. Well, mind how you go. Ten thirty-six is the time, and uh, and that's that. I think for another month. Well, I, I, what about the bridge in Hammersmith? <laughs> I bloody hate motoring questions. I really yeah. do. But the bridge in Hammersmith is uh, it's going to cost two hundred and fifty million quid now. I saw that's, a, a that's, Tory councillor suggesting it should be named after you. That's that's the by the way, the, 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 the cost of repairing Hammersmith Bridge is not new. So Hammersmith Bridge is a bridge owned by uh, the council, Hampstead and Fulham. Uh, we know it's been closed to vehicles for a number of years. Uh, H&F have said quite clearly they can't afford to pay for the bridge to be repaired to a standard that allows vehicles to go over like uh, buses. Uh, TFL don't own the asset and haven't got that sort of money either. Uh, the government are the only people that can afford to pay for the cost of that bill being uh, repaired. Before the last mayoral election, uh, the government said they would pay for that bridge to be mm. repaired if the Tory won. The Tory didn't win, so they've withdrawn the offer to pay for that bridge being uh, repaired. It's a classic example of a political stunt and the government withholding cash for that bridge and because the council is Labour and the mayor is Labour. I'd ask them to stop playing games with the residents in and around uh, Hammersmith uh, Bridge. Many of them desperately need to get across that bridge. We want buses to go across that bridge. And, you know, the sooner they agree to pay for the cost of the bridge being repaired, the better. Um, and finally, an attack on a ULES camera and a set of traffic lights led to a child being injured in a car accident, police have said. Yeah, look, can I, I, was, I, was, I was notified about this uh, yesterday. Uh, can I be quite clear in relation to uh, uh, this issue? Look, the decision to expand the ULES was a difficult one for me to take, but it's the right one for me to uh, make. I understand, though, 
there are people who oppose my policy of expanding the ULIS. I think it's legitimate to protest, but the way to protest should be lawful, uh, peaceful and safe. This is just one example of the consequences of those who are against the ULIS breaking the law because we've got a situation where a child has been injured as a consequence of actions from those who are anti ulas I'd encourage them to protest in a way that's lawful, peaceful and safe because what we don't want is, God forbid, God forbid, an injury that's even more serious. Well, this has been directly linked by, by police to oh, yeah. the destruction of... Well, we had, of, we had, we, we had a few weeks ago... And what do you say to Ian Duncan Smith who, who said he was happy for people to sabotage these cameras because well, they are, in his own words, facing an imposition that no one wants? Well, I, I think for people like him to you know, justify and explain the use of an improvised explosive device used last month to, to explain uh, to this child and their family the consequence of uh, their actions. And by the way, uh, many of us rightly criticise when those who feel passionately about the environment, like Just Up Oil and Extinction Rebellion, break the law. Uh, there should be some consistency. And I'd hope Mr Ian Duncan Smith and those others who support these these sorts of lawbreaking would also be consistent in relation to criticising, condemning and asking these people to stop this sort of lawbreaking. Many thanks. Pleasure always. It is just coming up to 22.11. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Thomas Watts up next with your headline. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.42 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, I, I don't know. I never, I, how... how I just never know, all right, what the Toto rule is. That you know, when I talk about pulling back the curtain so that you can see what's going on in the studio. And but but I I I, I can tell you this: getting the show back up and running after we've done a phone in with the mayor is is notoriously difficult. I've got a very powerful and and moving guest to introduce you to shortly, but I currently have ninety seconds of airtime to fill. Um, luckily, smear Kier, we can actually reveal. Should we run through the shortlist and then announce the winner? And this is proper. We've done it proper, like proper grown-ups with proper radio shows. We've counted all the votes. We've got an actual winner. It turned out that one of the entries was actually a professional sting maker for a rival radio station, which means that I can get rival radio stations to make me some production for free in their own time, but I can't get my own radio station, despite having the most popular programme on the entire station, I can't get my own radio station to make me a production in, in time to actually, well, before I forget about the feature that the production is designed to accompany. So should we run through the shortlist again? Or should we just announce the short shortlist? Shortlist. Just watching the clock. 10.44 is the time. So this was ent- so right, it's Bob, Tim, Adrian, Aidan, Mo and Simon. We'll, we'll play them in order. This was Bob. Smear kill. <laughs> I think Bob came second. Did Bob come second? I think he was pretty close. Anyway, this was Tim. Let's speak about simply, won't I? Yeah, and I believe in velvet socialism. We now come to the leader of the opposition. of donkey fees. Smear Kier with James O'Brien. That was brilliant, Um, but a bit too long, I I, I guess, the the voters decided. It also sounded like Matt Green at the end, didn't it? The comedian Matt Green. I don't know who was doing the voice. Uh, Adrian? Smear yeah. That was good as well. I got quite a lot of votes. Uh, number 11 was Aiden. Smear Kier. Num- th- I like that too. Punchy. 14 was Mo. Well, I liked all of them, actually. Smear Kier. Smear Kier. Smear Kier. That was my favourite. I can tell you now because the voting is over. That was my favourite. And I do a little thing in the studio whenever it plays. I do a little jig sort of, like like a shushy thing. Uh, and finally, number 21, Simon. Smear a keer. Uh, quite theatrical. And the winner is, miraculously, my favourite. I was certain we were going to come last. Number 14, Mo, is now the official Smear Kier jingle. Smear Kier, Smear Kier. And I've got a smear here for you in the next hour of the programme. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.49 is the time. You, you've heard me um, on a, quite a few occasions with regard to quite a few issues describe them as being in that category where you don't know anything about a subject until suddenly you need to know everything. 
it, 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 it's a sort of almost a case of being ambushed by life or by fate, by reality. I came up with it when we were talking about care homes, finding a care home for a, for a family member. You know nothing about it. You might have heard radio phone-ins about it or read the odd article, but unless you actually need to find a bed for your mum, you don't know anything about it. And then suddenly you need to know everything. I, I read a story yesterday that is absolutely in the same category. Um, Kerry Menai Davis, who is with me in the studio, lo- lost his little boy, Hugh, to a very, very rare form of cancer. But the reason I mention that phenomenon of, of not knowing anything until suddenly you need to know everything, well, it is because what, what you discovered, Kerry, in the, in the starkest of circumstances is that when you need to press pause on your life, on your livelihood, mm-hmm. on, on everything, to care for a, 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 a profoundly sick family member, in, in your case, I'm so sorry, uh, your, your little boy, there's no help there at all. Uh, no, no, and it's something that you think that would be there, um, and we talk about everyone helping the most vulnerable in the country, and when you're thrown into it, you could be just having a normal weekend and your child displays a symptom and you're thrown into all of a sudden being told that your child has cancer, as we were, and then to realise that actually one parent has to be a full-time caregiver, and, and it was Francis, my wife, and then I had to share um, work with looking after a sibling as well. You think, well, well then you've got to worry about how you're going to pay your mortgage, mm. how you're going to pay your bills, you, you're losing 50% of your income. And as I mentioned to you before we come on, if you're bringing a child into the world... Um, you're covered with maternity and paternity. You're, you can go back to your job. You can get um, allowances from the government. But if you have a chronically ill child or a terminally ill child, there seems to be a loophole where there is nothing available for those parents. And, and what we're doing is trying to create, um, sort of a, fill that void to mm. make sure that they are supported. It, it, is. it is extraordinary. And you, you, you factor in as well, of course, the, the, the need for treatment. And in, in, in Hugh's case, a 100-mile round trip, I think, that you and... Francis would, would sort of share or alternate because you had to look after Yeah, well, we, we did it during the second lockdown. So Hugh was diagnosed in October half term. Um, and in the space of seven days, he went from sitting up, eating a jam donut in his bed mm. to being on oxygen, receiving chemotherapy to, to save his life, basically. And you're thrown into it. You're given the cancer 101 immediately. And obviously, your body, you're just in a different planet completely. And, um, yeah, it's just... Uh, it's hard. And we were like ships in the night, five days on, five days off. We never saw each other and very isolated. And it's of course. It was a bit, um, obviously, very traumatising at the time. Yes, deeply lonely. But during the worst time of your life, the it, support of the person that you need. Well, is, is... I think even if a parent, we, we speak to parents now for the charity, they're going through it now, and it's lonely for them now. But we, we obviously went through it during COVID where we couldn't see anyone, and which is completely isolating. And um, we were lucky in a sense that furlough was around and introduced by the government at that point. And so that's what we come up with the idea of well, why they can really introduce it then and why can't we introduce it now to help those who have to go off work without any reason whatsoever apart from look after a sick child. So, so it, it, it presented itself in a sense while you were suffering the problem, the solution presented itself. If you can do it for people who can't work as a COVID, can you please do it for people who can't exactly. work because and, of and, chronic illness? And the model is already there. Yes. And then so there's, there's two elements to it, really. Those that are employed the onus is put on the employer. They, there is no set parameters of what they should be doing, so mm. they don't know what to do if a parent mm. has to go off and look after their child. And also, if you're self-employed, there is nothing anyway. You're, but, you're, well, the same with COVID, wasn't it? Yeah, but you're also put into a position where um, if you're earning money, you can't claim universal credit. So there's means tested, so if you are having a job, you can't go off and then claim that. And yeah, it's that, A loophole's the right word to use because no one wants it. This system doesn't make sense. No one's going to be going into bat to defend it, and no one has deliberately imposed it upon families like you. It's, it's, it's just that it's never really come to light before you... No, exactly, and I think... And that's obviously the case when people do go through this. Sometimes they do grieve in silence and not want to, yeah. to go through it and, and fight it. And obviously we found the loop, and we speak to parents, countless amounts of parents that we've encountered on our charity, and we've even spoken to parents who have had to sell their homes, sell their clothes, make a choice between eating for themselves and feeding their child. And people just don't understand. It's not just the fact that you're leaving work. It's the incurred cost of looking after a sick child. So in Hugh's case, he obviously had a, a rare form of cancer, and he had the most aggressive chemotherapy that you could have, mm. which meant that his immune system was basically zero when you'd go home. And we did it during a pandemic, pre-vaccination, so we were very careful. Crikey. But also, you have to heat your home during the winter. The cost of living has made that a fortune for parents because a damp home means respiratory viruses, potentially. You have to completely sanitise your house all the time to prevent going into hostels and these stays. And eating as well for parents. Like 
I'm six foot 110 kilos. <laughs> I like food. Not in a, well, I should be less of it. But, <laughs> Shouldn't we all, mate? Shouldn't yeah, but the all? delivery fees, I was spending £2,000 on delivery, I calculated, for yeah. six months. Good Lord. So it's just those added costs that aren't accounted for. Uh, and you took the story to your MP. We spend a lot of time giving MPs a tough time on this programme. It's quite nice to come across one who has um, who's got it right. Sir Oliver Heald, um, who's my uh, MP for North and East Hertfordshire, do you know, they do get a bad rap, and I, I do listen to the radios, <laughs> and we do, everyone does give them a hard time sometimes, but you know, I will give Sir Oliver every credit that he has really gone out of his way to really help us. He, when I first spoke to him, he got me on a Zoom call within a week, and mm. um, this was just before Christmas, just about a month after Hugh died, and we went from discussing this, and he introduced me to the Health Minister, Edward Arger, and we went from stage to stage, and then we introduced this as a private members bill in June, and it didn't progress any further, and then on 6th of December, we went to Prime Minister's questions. I've got an interest in politics, and I said, I'd love to see it one day, and as I walked in, he said, I'm going to ask the Prime Minister a question today. I was like, wow, and then Rishi Sunak full heartily supported us, which he's done. My wife and I burst into tears in the gallery, as you can imagine. It's just <laughs> a, a, a emotions. And then so it's come to today where Saul have introduced it as a private members bill and fingers crossed our second reading is today and then this goes through to the committee stage. Um, and, and, and then hopefully becomes law. Yeah, so what we're asking, I, I don't know the intricacies of Parliament, but I think we're asking in the initial stage a report from the Treasury on the merits of giving parents in, in our position and lots of families, there's 4,000 children a year that are diagnosed and have to go in hospital for more than two months. We're asking for them to give us the merits of offering them a financial support system. And it's not just a, um, a credit they're asking for. There is a lag which is not known until you're in it. So mm. you can't claim disability living allowance till your child has been three months diagnosed. And then it can take three to six months to come in after that. So that's there's a tough, six to nine months yeah. lag well, between receiving anything. And that's, that's including your blue badge, which you need to then pay for parking with. Sure. Some families can absorb that. Many families can't. And, and that's course. the stories that we hear all over the country. Um, what's the name of the charity, Kate? It's Never You. Why is it called It's Never um, You? My wife, unfortunately, was the person that had to receive all the bad information on the 23rd of October uh, because of COVID. She was the only one allowed into the hospital. I was allowed in there at 4 a.m. when they told us that, you know, Hugh had cancer. Yeah. And she turned around to me and said, you know, you always think it's someone else. It's never you. And there'll be someone listening to this today. We're thinking, God, those parents, I feel so sorry for them. And I, I hope to God it's not them. But, you know, I was the same. I'd listen to broadcasts and things mm. and read newspaper articles about childhood cancer. And we did everything we could for Hugh. And never, you can't blame yourself or anything, but it's just one of those things that happened. And it's always someone else. It's never you. And that's why we called it. It's never you. You don't know what's around the corner. And there's a shared determination here to, to ensure that some good comes out of yeah, your, your tragedy. Uh, and Hugh's Law, which is it's known as in the media and obviously it's got the terminology in the parliament, but Hugh's Law, which is commonly known as, will give us a legacy for Hugh. And it's given me and my wife a purpose to, to carry on and create a legacy for him. And, you know, having the messages from this morning about parents just, just messaging us saying, you know, this is so much needed. Mm. I've longed for someone like you to come along well, and push thank us. you. But I mean, on behalf of all of those parents, both the ones who have been through it are going through it. And as you and, and, and Francis's words remind us, the ones who have no inkling whatsoever that actually they're going to. Because it'll happen today and tomorrow and the next day, won't it? There's, the families, they'll be hit by these bombshells. And I think it's five a day in the UK, right. children a day under the age of 14 that are diagnosed with cancer every day. And it's not just cancer patients. This is all children with chronic illnesses. So, Tell yeah. me a bit about Hugh. Uh, how would I describe him? Most courageous, brave uh, child you'd ever meet most genuine loving boy on his sixth birthday which was 18 days before he passed away he didn't fancy his cake um, it was, um, he chose it and then didn't yeah. want it and then um, but he was starting to feel a bit unwell but he out of that his little brother Rafe um, was a bit upset he didn't get presents so Hugh gave him his birthday present said you can have it Rafe to play with and all the way through Hugh's treatment um, he was just a, like a beacon of strength. And for example, that when he first got diagnosed, you, you, they geared up for all the, the, the biopsies and mm. having a Hickman line inserted. And you know, as a parent, it's the worst thing you could ever witness your child being put under for an operation and all these things. And it's just going so quickly. And they give you a little buzzer. So, you know, he's in recovery after he goes in. And I remember my wife, Frances, she was the one who had the buzzer. I said, I couldn't handle that for anxiety reasons. I said, <laughs> so you take the buzzer. And anyway, he, he buzzed it. He came into recovery. And I was sitting in, I remember sitting in the hospital room just waiting for him is he going to be asleep is he going to be in pain he walked in sitting upright eating a jam donut in bed and I thought right if he's going to be like this then that's the way we're going to be and from that moment Fran and I made a vow that we'd never shed a tear in front of him right. and we just said like if, if you're a five year old in your bed with doc wires and doctors point needles in you what would you want you'd want your mum and dad to be strong in front of you yeah. and that's what we've made a vow to do and 
the age of him made him ignorant to it. Sure. And um, that was the beauty of what he, his age was made him ignorant, and it helped us in a way. But he was just a complete, to coin the phrase, a legend. So are you, actually, and your wife. Um, how can people find out more about the work that you're doing, or, or indeed if they need to, how can they get in touch yeah, with the Yeah, of course. Charity? So um, our website, it's neveryou.com, but also we're quite um, uh, got a following on Instagram, it's neveryou, sorry, it's dot neveryou charity. But also part of the charities, I built the first children's cancer platform, like a social media app. So if parents are there are struggling with their child for under cancer treatment, they can download our app on the platform on Apple and Android called the Children's Cancer Platform. And we have nearly 350 families using it now, talking to each other about how their experiences are going. And I think that's the greatest thing is, is creating a community where parents can share and support each other for mental health reasons. So Th- that's incredible, isn't it? Because the, the, the as we touched on the loneliness, partly compounded in your mm. case by COVID, but just to know that other people are going through what you're going through must be a great comfort. It is. And also doctors can only tell you so much and nurses and they're going home to a healthy family. And um, one of the oh. things that I wanted to come off was Facebook because my first world problem was someone else's nightmare at that time. And Google's full of misinformation. You can type the world is flat and it comes up with 20,000 pages. And I never wanted to get misinformation. So one of the things I wanted to do was create a safe space with correct information where parents can go on and know that everyone else around them has experienced or have experienced the same problems. And that's, do you know, it's like being in the, in the kitchen at the hospital where you're asking, oh, what's the best shampoo for my child's mm. bald head? Mm. I know that sounds no. embarrassing, but cool. what's my sensitive one? And what, what do you put on their NG plasters on their face to make sure it doesn't burn them? And that's the sort of conversation that you, <laughs> you're thrown into. Have you always been like this? Have you always been someone who looks mad? Uh, well, no. no well, <laughs> we're not talking about politics. Have you always been someone who who, who tries to help others? Um, I would always say I've, I've tried to, but since Hugh passed away, it's made my wife and I realise that you know you get loads of requests for charities and stuff in the work that I'm in, and I always do like charity golf days. I'm always asked, and you kind of looked upon them like, oh God, here's another charity and yeah. thing, but. You don't realise actually what charities do until you're in that moment and how much they support you because they are they do prop up every government service and public service, which is sad in a way, but charities are only formed really just because of someone's bad experience or yes. the need to choose something. But I will say that since Hugh has passed away, it has given me a purpose to help others in that same position because we went through hell. Other parents are going through hell. They don't need to go through hell because we can try and help them in a way. And there's many other charities like me out there that are doing this and all because of their, their grieving or they find that themselves they need to change something. Um, but, yeah, it does, it does give you an eye-opener. Um, I certainly I turned 40 last year and I certainly didn't expect when I was 40 to have lost a son and to have a charity and to <laughs> push a law through Parliament. So things turn quite quickly, as you know, and it's one of those things that... Um, you're just thrown into, but you you, you have to react to it. You, you, you honour Hugh's memory in a quite extraordinary fashion. Thank you. You really do. And and off to the Commons after this? Um, yeah, going straight after this now, yeah. You're yes. going to burst the tears again, aren't you? Uh, oh, I don't know if I can dance <laughs> in the chamber, <laughs> but I'll do something. <laughs> um, Kerry, thank you. Kerry Menai Davis, uh, whose, whose charity It's Never You is doing, well, as you now know, doing absolutely extraordinary work, and you've won an awful lot of new admirers as well. Not that... Not that you care or not that that's why you're here, but I can tell you that you have. Thank you, mate. Thank Good you. luck. Thank it's you. 11. It's 11.03. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Minutes after 11 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. He, he was quite an impressive man, wasn't he, Kerry? You never know what, 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 what sort of... Um, people are going to be like when you when you arrange to meet them and i knew his work was incredible but what, what a guy seriously some people just uh they just impress you don't they and i can tell from my inbox that um that that, that carrie didn't just impress me it is seven minutes after 11 we, we turn our attention next to a story that i think we knew was coming we didn't know it was coming on october the 7th when we reeled at the horror and the depravity of hamas's attack on that music festival in southern israel and we didn't know it was coming uh, a week or so later when it became fairly clear that israel's response to that terror attack was going to be close to apocalyptic that the destruction that they were going to wreak upon the gaza strip and the civilians who were going to die as a consequence would be counted not in the hundreds but in the thousands. Um, I, I would say that probably by the beginning of November, particularly when we started educating each other on the uh, pronouncements of some members of 
Benjamin Netanyahu's coalition in Israel, in the Israeli government, particularly when we began to see and hear some fairly chilling statements about nuclear bombs and, and the like from Israeli politicians. We, I think, by the beginning of November had begun to fear that Netanyahu's plan did not involve any lip service even to a two-state solution. Then things went a bit odd because of some uh, uh, chants in protests on British streets about the river to the sea coming from supporters of Palestinian people, a chant that is historically perceived as a call for the abolition of the modern state of Israel and indeed for the removal or expulsion or worse of all Jewish people in that territory and and that assumed particularly for a certain type of right-wing commentator that assumed a strange heft that phrase and our attempts to point out that Likud had campaigned on the same words not long ago Benjamin Netanyahu's party had campaigned on the same words not long ago those fell in the context of the British media and the American media but not intriguingly the rest of the world um, fell on largely deaf ears and when I mention the rest of the world I, I, I'm thinking of among many other things I'm thinking about a case brought by South Africa against Israel at the International Court of Justice that could conclude that Israel has been embarked upon genocidal conduct in that region but we, we, we wait for, for that case to conclude, I'm comfortable with the phrase ethnic cleansing. I'm not comfortable with it, I hate it, but I'm comfortable that, that, that semantically and intellectually it describes what has, um, what has happened there in the last few months. And now it's happened. The Israeli Prime Minister has stated that he rejects any notion whatsoever of a two-state solution to this crisis. He will reject any move to establish a Palestinian state when Israel ends its offensive against Gaza, and he has insisted that all territory west of the Jordan River would be under Israeli security control, which means Israel will be in charge from the river to the sea. And I don't know how some people process this. I, I, I really don't. And, and I mean good people. People who have, I mean, centuries of justification for supporting Israel's defense of itself and attacks upon its enemies. And, and yet who also clung throughout, and presumably still do, cling to the notion that a two-state solution is, is the only viable conclusion. Uh, if you're looking for a conclusion that doesn't perpetuate the carnage or, or the tension or the enmity, then there has to be a Palestinian homeland, as it were, um, a, a recognizable state. But Benjamin Netanyahu, as many of his critics have both predicted and expected, Benjamin Netanyahu has now essentially established his profound opposition to the establishment of a Palestinian state. And that won't surprise anyone who's watched things closely. There's been the occasional very, very lukewarm support for the idea, but he's nothing if not a political pragmatist. He's nothing if not a, 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 a political opportunist, and he will say whatever gets him through the day in certain circumstances, not unlike Boris Johnson and others. Um, and here, here is the conclusive proof of... Um, what has been the case for many years. That, that uh, campaigning slogan that, 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 that the Likud party has in its founding charter, I believe, states between the sea and the Jordan there will only be Israeli sovereignty. So, I, I mean, that bit I don't quite get, just as an observer of this conflict who has always sought to be honest. I think you can only be honest and, and fair and if, if you count tragedy honestly, then you will feel the same about two deaths, regardless of the identity of the dead, particularly when we move into the context of children. And, 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 and so many people, it seems to me, don't. So many people with the loudest contributions to make to this debate 
care more about a dead Palestinian child than they do about a dead Israeli child or care more about a dead Israeli child, a dead Jewish child, than they do about a dead Palestinian child. And and the, the hardest thing, and I'm not going to spend much time asking you to feel sorry for me on this subject, but the hardest thing about doing it fairly without making it pretty clear that you have a side, that you have more support for the families of one dead child than you do for the families of another one. The hardest thing about doing that is that it upsets people. It upsets people who can't quite see. And I understand why you can't quite see, but it upsets people who can't quite see that that is the only position that an honest observer c could or should adopt. I will not feel sorry <laughs> for a family burying a child because they are from that religion or this religion or that part of the world or this part of the world or that side of a border or, or this side of a border. So here we are. Um, he has said it now. He has publicly and sharply rebutted American foreign policy. Biden has expended huge political capital supporting Israel. He has uh, alienated a lot of people, as has Rishi Sunak. Public opinion, very different to government opinion on both sides of the Atlantic. When the numbers pass 10,000, 20,000 dead, with the fear, of course, that there will be many, many more uh, as, as the um, rubble is cleared, public opinion is, is, is a combination of outrage and bafflement. And throughout it all, people I like and respect who pay me the compliment of phoning my program have all denied, have all believed that the destruction of the Gaza Strip and the replacement of what was there with Israeli rule was not on the table. I said to you some time ago, I said two things. I, I attended the Anne Frank Trust lunch yesterday, which is one of the, always one of the most moving dates in my calendar every single year. Michael Morpurgo gave the address, and I can't convey the power of his words. That's why he's one of the best storytellers the country has ever produced. But, 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 but it was incredible. I sat next to a lovely man, a rabbi. We spoke honestly and frankly about some of these issues. And... And I can't conceive, really, of what it must be like to know now that the man in whom you put your faith, the man in whom you put your support, was lying. That there was, in his mind, no desire for a peaceful solution, a two-state solution. There was a desire only for destruction. All the talk of eradicating Hamas and securing the release of the hostages was, 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 was a camouflage, really, for the creation of Israeli rule from the river to the sea. I, I mean, I, it's such a, a moment that I can't quite believe it, particularly against the backdrop of political opportunists and, and, and dreadful provocateurs and professional device dividers like Suella Braverman trying to criminalize almost the pro calling it hate marches when palestinian supporters used language that the prime minister of israel is now using on a podium it's extraordinary it's extraordinary so regardless of your position although i think it's preferable that you have one no, it's not, because I wouldn't be able to ring in then. Uh, I, if your position is, like mine, heartbreak and um, equanim equanimity, then you are welcome to ring in as well, if, in other words, you don't have any family or, or, or historical uh, skin in the game, for want of a, of a better phrase. Then how do you process this development? How do you process this news? Whether you thought it was coming, whether you knew it was coming or not, how do you deal with Benjamin Netanyahu's stated belief that Israel should be in power from the river Jordan to the sea? 0345 A couple of texts just to set things up. Um, 
This is from Leslie. Please, 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 can you stress throughout that this is not what the majority of Israeli people want, in the same way that the majority of British people don't want these flights to Rwanda. It's the Israeli government and not the Israeli people. My Israeli friends are as horrified by this as we are. I lived in Israel and saw firsthand how Jews and Arabs can live and work alongside each other beautifully. Netanyahu wants Trump back. They are peas in a pod. Lisa is a little less forgiving. Anyone who saw it any other way must be so naive. Um, what is public opinion in Israel, says Sarah? Um, and how can you possibly negotiate a two-state solution, this is from Lucy and Bushy, or anything else with the murdering barbarians in Gaza? These are Israel's neighbors who said they would repeat October the 7th atrocities again and again and again in capital letters. If you were Jewish, would you want these monsters living next door to you? Um, no, of course I wouldn't. Uh, but, you know, neither would I want 12,000 children to be killed. Not even next door to me, in my own home. So, I, I, again, I understand your emotion, Lucy, but I, I don't know that I understand your thinking. Unless, of course, you have been in favour all along of the complete destruction of Gaza and the replacement of it with Israeli sovereignty from the river to the sea. And that's fine, as long as you've said so all along and didn't either pretend to believe or profess to believe or truly believe when supporters of the Israeli government were saying that this is about eradicating Hamas and, and getting the hostages free and it's categorically not about conquering, if you like, or, or occupying or annexing or ruling over the Gaza Strip. You, you, you dismissed those fears and those criticisms. But now Benjamin Netanyahu has let you down. I said two things. I said two things at the beginning of this. And I said them carefully because you have to be careful. The first thing I said is that be careful whose support you sign up. Because there are some people in the, in the British political sphere and certainly in the British media who, who, who profess to be allies but are not at all. They, they, they might be motivated by Islamophobia or a hatred of, of, of Muslims rather than a, a love for Israel or, or a, a sympathy with Jewish people. And, and the second thing I said is that Netanyahu must not be allowed to become a representative for all supporters of Israel because he will, I, well, I think betray many of the people that support him when the contents of his soul emerge. And that's why I cited that book by Max Hastings when he uh, he quoted a young Benjamin Netanyahu who is a biographer of Netanyahu's older brother and Max Hastings quoted him as uh, essentially um, being supportive of the idea of the eradication of Arabs, Arab people. So here we are. I don't want any rows today. And I, I actually really don't. Um, I know that might be a naive hope or a bit optimistic, but I just want to know how you are processing the latest development and, and the irrefutable fact that the Prime Minister of Israel believes that Israel, not only believes that Israel should rule from the river to the sea, but also intends to make that happen. 0345 6060 Three is the number you need. It's 11.21. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 24 minutes after 11 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Stephen Holloway says he's only saying that Israel should have security control, James. I think you might be over-egging it. I, I suppose I should say that I hope so. But it does, I'm afraid, signal um, an abandonment of any commitment to the idea of a two-state solution. There's, there's no other way of looking at it than that, uh, unless you want to add the words for now to the end of that sentence. And, and, and I, listen, Steve, I understand why you, it, you would want me to be over-egging it. I would want me to be over-egging it as well, because this is such a stark departure from the narrative that, that, that supporters of Israel, and I am a supporter of Israel, but I am not a supporter of what Israel has done latterly in the Gaza Strip. I'm not a supporter of lots of things that Israel has done. But, you know, the, the ease with which you can separate the two is, is, is enormous. It would be like saying that being a supporter of Britain means you have to be a supporter of Boris Johnson. It's an absurd suggestion, albeit uh, uh, one with rather less bloody consequences. Um, and another, another tweet that, that I think speaks to a similar 
position, a similar hope. Netanyahu will be out of power by the end of the year. What he says doesn't matter. Well, that's clearly not true. He's the one that is deciding on the current um, course of action in, in Gaza and everywhere. Uh, he also didn't say Israeli rule from the river to the sea. He referred to security control. That That is not the same thing. I'm happy to repeat that and, and acknowledge that is what some people believe. But um, uh, it is an opinion, not a fact that you state. I think that describing this as uh, an abandonment of any support for the establishment of a Palestinian state is a fact as opposed to an opinion. But as with everything... Um, you are welcome to see it from another angle. Russell is in Golders Green. Russell, what would you like to say? Oh, good morning, James. Hi. Hello, um, I, I think the, the, the main point that I wanted to make was uh, similar to what the, uh, you, the, you just read out of a tweet of someone yeah. saying that uh, Netanyahu won't be in power by the end of the year. And uh, I think that is definitely the case. And Israel is a democracy at the end of the day. And I think that um, the, the Israelis have seen the fact that... Uh, uh, you know, he called himself Mr. Security. Yes. Um, he's, he's totally failed on that fact. Uh, the fact that there are still over 100 hostages being held by Hamas in uh, Gaza. Uh, he's doing very little apart from, as you say, you know, causing, trying to destroy uh, Hamas, uh, but killing um, uh, lots of uh, uh, Gazan civilians at the same time. Uh, a lot of Israelis are, are very uncomfortable about that. Mm. I'd say the, the, the majority probably uh, are. Um, and uh, equally within Israeli society, it's become very polarized yes. uh, as a nation. Um, uh, he, he won't, he, uh, there'll be an election. I read just, just read in the Jerusalem Post that the uh, that his emergency cabinet is uh, close to uh, collapse, and they've seen the damage that, the, and the Israelis have seen the damage that the extreme right wing, uh, his cabinet ministers, have done uh, throughout the, the rest of the country, um, uh, to the country, and their actions um, in the West Bank as well. So, um, uh, whilst you know, whilst he, he he's clinging to power at the moment, James. Um, but I think he, I, I think it's on the verge of collapse. They might keep him on until they finish their campaign in Gaza. But um, after that, um, he's gone. So and he won't get, be the I person. Think, ultimately, he won't be the person making the decision about what happens when the offensive is over. You're suggesting. I it. don't think so. No. But are you I, clutching exactly at straws a bit? Are you, and, and, and I mean that in a nice way. Are you? Are you? Are you trying to move your own focus away from what he said with regard to the? two-state solution and, and sort of console yourself with the thought because people have been consoling themselves with the thought that Netanyahu won't be in power for much longer for quite a long time, Russell. Mm. No, I, 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 I've, I've looked at polls that say yeah. that, that, that uh, he's um, very unpopular at the moment. Uh, the reason, I mean, the reason why he's clinging there, well, the reason why he's still in power is because um, uh, he, he, as, soon as, he, as soon as he finishes, uh, he's, in, uh, he's in court. He's, yes, uh, he's in criminal court. So why, um, why, why do you think he's made this move then? Because it alienates or it embarrasses the White House, it embarrasses Joe Biden, it... it, it Essentially, I, I, I would argue it, it betrays many people who've spoken up in support of Israel's current campaign in Gaza because it, 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 it changes the parameters of motivation in a way. It changes, it changes the aim. And in the context of the rhetoric of, of river to sea, which is such a loaded phrase as we've spent yeah. many weeks discussing, he, 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 he doesn't really help anybody except presumably in his own mind himself. So why do you think he's done this at this point? Uh, simply because he yeah. wants to keep his right-wing cabinet on side. Right. Um, okay. I, in, in, in so, yeah, sometimes view, we overcomplicate things, don't we? So, so short-term political advanta- ad- advantage. Absolutely, um, I, I, because I, I, and because he's trying, he's trying, he he's trying to be the pivot, the, ma- the, the man in the middle. Basically, right. trying to keep the Israeli society. I, I, this is how I perceive it, James. No, I, uh, of course. Keep, uh, he, he tries to keep Israeli, the general Israeli society on side, but at the same time, he knows that he's got to, he, he, the only way he can stay in power is by keeping the, uh, for want of a better word, largesse of his um, yeah. uh, extreme right, 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 and, right and wing And it's a place, uh, it, 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 I mean, to, just to go a little further, it's a place to which he can go because it probably does tally with his 
secret thoughts. He, he, I mean, it, well, not even secret. It is not difficult to find support for the notion that Netanyahu has never been in favor of the establishment of a Palestinian state. So that that would be the big picture. But the small picture would be that the, the current state of, of his cabinet government, the current state of his precarious yeah. position, if you like, as prime minister, which is scant comfort to, 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 to anybody um, counting the, the, the cost of this position, but is a valid explanation. Thank you, Russell. Um, 11.31 is the time. If you want to join in, remember, you don't just get to challenge anything that I say. You can challenge anything that anybody else says. You, you, you know what to do. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 25 minutes to 12 is the time. Um, 20, more than 24,600 Palestinians have been killed. Uh, 85% of, of the rather narrow coastal territory that makes up the um, uh, uh, Gaza Strip. 2.3 million people have fled their homes and the United Nations says a quarter of the population is starving. Um, in, in recent days, perhaps getting less news coverage than it did at the beginning of the uh, um, a, a mission. In in recent days, uh, a series of major raids launched by the Israeli military across much of the territory seen further intense fighting and bombardment in Gaza. And it was the Prime Minister Netanyahu who has talked of needing to be capable of saying no to our friends. So international voices calling for restraint, calling for ceasefire, which is most of the world albeit not the UK and the USA, um, stating yesterday his opposition to the establishment, any establishment of a Palestinian state, therefore dismissing out of hand the prospect of what has become known as a two-state solution um, and describing the need for Israel to maintain security control over all territories west of the Jordan River. And I just wonder how you process that if part of your reluctant or, or, or uncomfortable support for the carnage in Gaza has has been built upon the idea that, that it would, or it was, um, a path to a two-state solution. How do you deal with the fact that Netanyahu was probably lying to you? Michael's in Leicester. Michael, what would you like to say? I'm, I'm, it's, it's just really about the, the thing that every time we get these sorts of situations, people seem to be shocked, or, or at least they want to demonstrate that they're shocked by hearing something that, you know, the likes of Netanyahu is saying. It could be somebody else in the political world, but this guy's been on the same mantra since 1996. Mm. Uh, I mean, the right the right wing of Israel got rid of Yitzhak Rabin in November of 1995, and by the summer of 96, Netanyahu was in charge. Netanyahu said publicly at that time, reported in Israeli press and and others that he was going to he was going to destroy the Oslo Accord, and he did that immediately by settlements by building new settlements. So he, he's had a track record. Um, he in 2019, famously the Likud party meeting, um, where where he he once again demonstrated what he thought was the right way forward by funding Hamas. Um, so Netanyahu de deliberately allowed funds into Hamas for on, on the, reason, for people he who, wanted. He, he, he thought he that that was the best way to. Alone. Yes, he, he thought that was the the, the the best way to push back against any move towards a two state solution by 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 seeing Hamas assume primacy over the PLO. You move further away because Hamas, like Netanyahu, remained committed to a, a single state solution, as it were. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could argue that Hamas, you know, stated that, but they had, they didn't have the political or military capability to enforce that. So no, but they had the they had the are, express they had the express ambition. But I take I take your point. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, I take yeah. your point. Uh, 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 well, and, I think and, are people not. Ranks, they're uh, have murderous individuals. Yeah. I, I think people are are shocked. If if shock is is the right word, partly that he said the quiet bit out loud at this point in this <laughs> way. Yeah. I think that you know, particularly yeah. in the context of what the White House has done, it is it is it is notable. Both both the timing and the tone is notable, and yeah. of course we must repeatedly make the point that he. It, or I think your uh, recollections of Netanyahu's interventions are accurate, but but that does not represent Israeli public opinion. So uh, you know, it it, oh. it it becomes well, it doesn't, does it? There's plenty of people yeah. in Israel who want no, a two state solution. No. no. But it's incredible the way the press will part, put this, like with Hamas. 
They, yeah. they, obviously, the Palestinians have voted Hamas. Well, actually, they haven't, because their last election, most mm-hmm. of these people in Palestine weren't even alive. Yes, this is true. So, since, 90, since 1996, who have the pa- Israeli people voted for? But what, yeah, they, 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 they voted in a way that has given Netanyahu a path to power. You're, you're absolutely, absolutely right. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and with the increasingly, other, so, the increasingly desperate coalitions, but nonetheless, he is the one that's ended up at the head of them again and again and again. I mean, uh, and the vehicles of power are such that, yes, the majority of people probably don't agree, but unfortunately, the way it's all been set up by the political elite particularly the right right of the of mm. the political elite means that he's very difficult to get him out of power and and the fact that he's he's a criminal in his own right and he's hanging on to power because if he doesn't he's almost got the monopoly go straight to jail card um and and, and that's where he deserves to be but there are other people i mean mark regev he goes on television he was on radio last week he he lies he, he distorts the truth almost to the opposite, well, and, he, then, he, and then we have to we have to share his righteous anger. It's it's wrong. He, he should be fact checked for every sentence because he's he's actually him and the other a, this is a spokesman for, for the for the Israeli Prime Minister. <laughs> For people who don't know, absolutely. Him. I mean, I mean call, calling someone Adani, a liar, is, I suppose you're within your rights of, of freedom of speech, but obviously that's something that he would dispute. <laughs> yeah, but he would tell some more lies in order to back that up. But which you, is you something, which is something say, else that he'd dispute. <laughs> Let's not do this all day. Yes, I know, but you see, if you go back through the history. You've only got to fact check him against what he said two, three weeks well, ago. Well, that 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 that's true. Already, of a, that's true. Yeah. Of, I mean, almost all political interviews in the current climate. Oh, yeah. But but I take your point. The stakes here oh, yeah. are, are much higher. I I think I the well, reason, well, the, I pick you up well, on the use of the word point, shock. I don't know that there is. Sh- I don't know that I'm finding shock. I'm certainly not expressing shock. I I, I I I mean, I'm asking whether people are shocked, particularly people who have been supportive of this campaign thus far but i think that in the british media the people who've been um chomping at the bit for for uh, protesters carrying banners calling for the palestinian uh state if you like to run from the river to the sea i think they process benjamin netanyahu calling for israeli security control to run from the river to the sea by ignoring it actually not by being shocked by it they just they just look the other way and, and, yeah, and, and, but they've, they've looked they've looked the other way since 1996 when he started the settlement. Yes, I agree with you. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm challenging your use of the word shock. I, d- I don't think that there is a sense of shock. I think that there is. Uh, I, I mean, uh, oh. there's a sense of of dismay among people who kind of knew it was coming, and a very disingenuous, if not dishonest, shrugging of shoulders and looking away from people who said that it wasn't. Because then the next statement you have to look at is, well, he's, he wants the river to the sea, so that's assuming he's talking about Jordan. But there's a there's a part of the right wing that wants to look at the rivers as being the Euphrates to the Nile. Well, there was an Israeli politician quite recently with a map, giving a speech next to a map of greater Israel that, that, that dispensed with the kingdom of Jordan. Indeed. So, I, I, Jordan, so you, yeah. what happens next then, briefly? I think what needs to happen is the United Nations, the need to, to, to grow up there, and um, the Americans, oh, it's difficult because they've, they've got the veto. The UK has, yeah. got to, has got to lead, you know, with a sense of honesty and, and not just being the poodle once again. We've, we, we've, got to, we've got to gain that stature that we're supposed to have on the inside. I used to travel around the world. Uh, as an engineer, right. and the people around the world used to hold us in in, in, in great esteem because they thought we were honest chaps, and yes. that was that that was a fair thing to say. But with all of the things that have gone on, with all of the scandals that we've had, with the politicians and the scandal, look at the prime ministers that we've had. Yeah. You know, it, in, through all walks of life, we're n- we're not showing that, and you can see that then on the international stage. We, we're just we're just not there. Uh, and you can see we're sitting on our hands and you're going, well, come on, tell some, tell the truth. Just say something. And, and that's why so today's the- development is significant, even if, as you describe it, was pl- 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 very predictable or, or not shocking. It's, it's significant because a lot of the political rhetoric on both sides of the Atlantic has, has been contingent upon a denial 
of what Netanyahu has now made obvious. Uh, you know, it has been saying we want a two-state solution. We don't we don't call for a ceasefire, but we do want a two-state solution. And now Netanyahu is saying, well, I don't. So what does that do to those supporters? That That's where growing a pair would be helpful. Indeed, indeed. And I mean, you've got to, you've got to feel sorry for the actual uh, Arab population within Israel itself, because they've been under the cosh. And they, they almost choked out as... Oh, we are a democracy. Look, we've got these people in amongst them. Yes, with the three different colour-coded ID cards running a system of apartheid. But, they, you know, that's by the by, isn't it? You know, Well, it's not by. It's not. I mean, it's, it's not by the by. It's, it's not pertinent to the very specific conversation that we're having today, but it's certainly per- context. It's certainly relevant to the broader context. Thank you, Michael. Um, just to pick you up on a point there, James, says Sarah, the Palestinian chant from the river to the sea is not about having a state from the river to the sea. It's about Palestinian people having freedom from the river to the sea. Please correct. I normally ignore messages that contain stentorian statements like please correct, but I won't ignore yours, Sarah, because I'm such a nice chap. That might be your reading of the phrase, but there are plenty of people for whom the phrase means precisely the opposite of what you claim. It absolutely means a, 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 an Arab state, if you if you like, from, from the river to the sea. And that, that is, of course, exactly what Hamas are dedicated to. And it was Hamas's actions on October the 7th that, of course, started th- this latest um, chapter of horror. Um, so you please correct. It's 11.46. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 11.49. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. The, um, I, I suppose in, in the context of how the world deals with this, you have to turn some of your attention to the uh, United Nations Supreme Court where South Africa have brought a case against Israel at the International Court of Justice um, uh, 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 accusing them of genocide. Benjamin Netanyahu inevitably and and predictably has already made it clear that he won't pay any attention whatsoever to what the verdict may be. Um, And you and I don't know yet whether or not the legal hurdle for genocide will be met. But by making this submission, there's a good piece by Nazreen Malik in The Guardian recently, by making this submission that recognises the seriousness of events and even the possibility that those events may amount to genocide, um, does rather highlight how bizarre uh, and, and inadequate the international response has been, especially now that we know um, that Benjamin Netanyahu doesn't give a fig about the prospect of a two-state solution. Quite the opposite, in fact. He wants Israeli security control from the River Jordan all the way to the sea. And I asked today simply how you process this development, how you, how you deal with this news um if uh, let me just find you what here's one if you're dealing with it by accusing me of anti-semitism as as one texter here has done then i mean you're you're wasting your time really and uh, i'll I'll read it to you just so you you get an idea of what i have to deal with your twisted analysis of netted i've also got one actually in the same thing saying that you've been shilling for the zionists since the beginning of this conflict, you should hang your head in shame. So uh, I'm shilling for the Zionists and I'm also anti-Semitic. It's a remarkably exhausting position to adopt, I have to tell you. Uh, Your twisted analysis of Netanyahu's motivation reveals your anti-Semitism. Palestinians repeatedly rejected the two-state solution, both through their PA leadership and Hamas. All Netanyahu has done is to finally and publicly acknowledge that fact. I, it's just bizarre, really, the, the way your brain has uh, uh, arrived at that conclusion and put the rest of the world on notice that a repeat of October the 7th will never be allowed to happen again. What would you have him do if your kids were down those tunnels, James? Well, I wouldn't want him to kill 12,000 of your kids, um, is, is, is my answer to that question. And very simply, if you, if you really are going to sort of stoop that low, the answer would be I would hope that the rescuing forces would behave as if the civilian children they encounter um, as if their lives were just as valuable as the lives of the children that they were going to rescue that's all um, but you asked I, I know that you, you, you don't expect sensible um, compassionate humanitarian answers to silly loaded horrible questions like that but there it is you, you can't imagine what it would be like to think that the two lives the life of the Israeli child and the life of the Palestinian child were worth the same. You can't get your head around that. 
And because you can't get your head around that, you lash out and, and accuse me of anti-Semitism. So if, 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 if a child I loved was being held in a territory where other children who I don't know live, I would hope that whoever was charged with rescuing my child respected the life of the other children who I don't know as much as they respected the life of my child. There's your answer, mate. Yeah. 11.53 is the time. Hussain's in Brighton. Hussain, what would you like to say? Hi, good morning, James. Um, yeah, I think um, you, you've got to look at the stated goals. Of this, should, this should be no surprise, what Netanyahu said, because of the stated goals of Zionism. And I know automatically that as soon as you say that word it can shut down conversation and it shouldn't because we're never going to get nowhere well it um, means so many different things to so many different people that's that's why i find it unhelpful I, I, and also i don't take this the wrong way but I, I always think it's a bit sad when people use a word and then say oh i know that's going to get me into trouble do you know what i mean hmm. so, so let's not do so that i'm going to i'm going to borrow i'm going to borrow a metaphor from rabbi yakov shapiro um, who's what, what, what he's saying is effectively Israel um, has got its hand stuck in the met metaphoric cookie jar and it's trying to get three particular cookies, which are stated objectives, if you like, which is that it wants Israel to be a country, it wants it to be a democracy, and it wants it to be a Jewish nation all at once. The problem is it can't have it all at once. If it wants to be a democracy, then you can't have, and I'm talking about now under a, um, a one-state solution, because that's where they get, that's a stated now objective, from the river to the sea. Not Fine. quite. I, I think there is a distinction, albeit not necessarily a profound one, between um, uh, security but, but, control and sovereignty. Right. But, but, but it certainly, can, you, it you, certainly, it certainly takes a two-state solution off the table. Right. You can't have a democracy and then say we're a Jewish nation. So you can't have a country of Israel. Because that runs uh, the possibility of one day there being a plurality, a majority of non-Jewish people. Exactly. This is the problem what I'm saying. It's got, got echoes uh, of Northern uh, Ireland, hasn't it? Well, it, it, this, uh, there has to be a compromise in the stated objectives. And, and if it was me, fine. One nation, let's have, sorry, one country, one state, um, every, it's a complete democracy, just in line with um, Western values, i.e. Um, everyone is equal. Every human being is equal. Demilitarize the whole zone. But it will never happen. Why? Because there's geopolitical issues um, going on here where it serves um, countries' interests to keep um, the state of or keep them in a perpetual state. Of, How does it? Um, I, 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 listen, it's happened. It's been over, what, 75 years. No, but who, whose interest does it serve? Because I, I don't know that it would... I mean, I, I don't know whether it would work or if not. If the US wanted to stop... If the US wanted to put their foot down, they could put their foot down tomorrow. All they've got to do is say no. It's as simple as that. There's UN resolution... Yes, but why? why? Resolution. I just... I just I, I'm not... I'm not um, badgering the witness. I'm just, I'm just no, no, curious. No, 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 What's your no. answer to the question of why it is... James, in other countries, it's impossible to answer in five minutes. But you know that there's an extreme um, Zionist movement, and I'm not talking about well, Jewish see, Zionist movement. No, I know, but you, way, you said it, it suits. Way, no, stop, 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 stop. Let's just sorry, let's just sorry, pick sorry, off one one leaf at a time. Yeah. I, I just I just don't know that I I don't know that I can, even in five hours, that I'd be able to explain why it is you in the interests yeah. in the interests of other countries to sustain the status quo. The the the, the status quo sustains because a majority of people in Israel want it, and and. And for an Israeli leader to say, right, we're, 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 we're tearing down the walls, we're, we're, we're opening the borders with Gaza and the West Bank, and you are all equal. That would be. Yeah, that's could, why it, it doesn't yeah. happen because it would be. Yeah. It would be. Um, you can't um, have your cake. There's an old. There's an old. No, I know you game. keep saying you that, but but that's nothing to do with other countries in the world. That's because an Israeli government could never do that in the current climate. No, but 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 sorry. Uh, so why why is it that Israel's allowed to have their cake? Because it's a neighbor. So, OK, we talk about the Iron Dome. There's a political Iron Dome that everybody's aware of. Who, who, who provides the political Iron Dome over Israel? Well, so America and the UK to... object to uh, use their... Uh, well, America in particular at, at, at the United Nations uses its veto to, to, to Israel's enormous and, and repeated advantage. But that, that is... That's not in the interests of America. That's that's a that's an ideological commitment to protecting the modern state of Israel as a so Jewish where does that state. Ideology come from the ideology, it, as I said, it comes from different factions. There will be there will no, be. It doesn't those, really. Example, it comes it comes from the post-war settlement of, on on the necessity for a country where Jewish people would be safe from persecution. That's okay, where it comes go, from, and, and, and to, lots of people are committed to that. I'm committed to that. I think you're, I think you're trying to cover too much territory, Hussein. 
I know, it's impossible. Well, uh, I manage I'm every just, day. Uh, I'm, well, uh, <laughs> have me by your side, James, and then I might give it a go. But in a, in a few minutes, the cover yeah. budget topic well, you don't, is don't Just, just, just to, to take off a little bit, bite, bite, bite off as much as you can chew at a time. Mm. Because I, I, I think the problem really is, is on both sides, for want of a better word, people who don't want a two-state solution. And, and you're right. I mean, the only viable... Uh, well, one viable conclusion would be a single state in which everybody was equal. But then, as you point out, you, you, you couldn't then guarantee that that would stay a Jewish state forever. But it will be a place where people can live in harmony and peace eventually, but it has yeah. to be supported worldwide. So you have to... This is what I'm saying. People, or as soon as you say the word Zionism, and people think of it as a dirty word, it's, look, if you don't address it head on, you've got to drop those stated aims. Just have a country... Uh, whoever's li- living there, let them live, let them prosper. Get the arms out if you need to get the arms out. But yeah, but you're being is, quite naive because... Of course I am. But, well, it, no, it, no, it's no. a utopia. No, well, it's, it's, not, not, it's not, no, but it's easy. I think it's easy for, for us to say that because you, Jewish people were living in, in countries as, as equals, as economic and social equals before, oh, be, be, before the pogroms and before the yes. Holocaust. So I, yes. I, I don't know that... I don't know that it so, is. So, so you, you've proved my point there, that, that Jews, in fact, you had indigenous Jews that were Arab, right? Yes. So, so yeah, they did live together. No, but I'm talking... You know that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, the unique nature of the post-Holocaust Israeli state, and, 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 and you're not acknowledging that uniqueness. Now, I might be wrong. Maybe it doesn't deserve a unique status, but I believe it does. And, 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 and you're... Analysis doesn't believe stated that goals, it does. James, huh? You can't have the stated goals of Zionism. Uh, otherwise, with this 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 circle of violence yeah. will continue. That may Something also be true. That that may also be true. Some... That may no. That may also be true. I mean, I don't think either of us would claim that we could solve this problem in a, in a conversation. But but I think that that is where the what's the phrase? The immovable force meets the whatever it is, where, where you have the stated goals, which are born of that unique post-Holocaust situation with the, with the modern world, if you like, with, with, the, with the situation on the ground nearly, nearly 100 years later, or 80 years later. And, and that makes an impossibility of what you were saying, uh, I think, or, albeit that it is utopian. We can agree on that. Thank you, Hussein. Um, it's 12 noon. James O'Brien on LBC. <laughs> James O'Brien on LBC. Four minutes after 12 is the time you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, a change of pace next. And, and sometimes at 12 o'clock on a Friday, we like to dip our toes into gentler waters, don't we? And I think we'll do that today. Um, albeit that, 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 that I do so with a nod towards the topic in the last hour and indeed to the speech that I heard Michael Morpurgo give at the Anne Frank Trust lunch. If you don't know about the Anne Frank Trust, I'd urge you to find out more about their work. They're an extraordinary, unique organisation, um, essentially seeking to ensure in the memory of Anne Frank that future generations are freed from some of the prejudices that have um, that have blighted ours and, and, and others. And, and in fact, Michael Morpurgo picked up on that in yesterday's speech when he talked of the mess that we've made being um, one that younger people, people who are children today, are going to have to try to fix. And you could be talking about almost any area of life, couldn't you, in that, in that context. Um, five minutes after 12 is the time. So, books and a coalition of authors, inc- including some of the biggest names in, in children's fiction, Julia Donaldson, she of Stickman, and uh, The Snail and the Whale, and, and uh, The Gruffalo, Mallory Blackman, um, Noughts and Crosses, and, 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 that, and plenty of other books, and of course Cressida Cowell, um, uh, and plenty of others, backing a call by Book Trust to ensure that every child from a low-income family has access to books. Morpurgo told the Telegraph earlier this week that screens, of course, had replaced books as a child's escapism uh, deliverer of choice. The instant gratification that they get from games or tablets and smartphones is sapping the attention span needed to read and appreciate literature. Um, and I think he has a point. 
when you press a button on your phone, he said, or your iPad, you get immediate satisfaction from it, whereas a book... Do you know the weirdest thing that happened to me with regard to books was lockdown? And, and for reasons I've never fully been able to actually unravel, I hardly read a thing during lockdown. I, I was expecting to work my way through all of the books I'd never got around to reading, you know. I was finally going to finish Ulysses. I was going to get cracking on War and Peace. Uh, and I would have, you know, read lots of escapist um, non-literary fiction as well. I, I, I'd, I'd cross continents for a brand new Harlan Coben or Jack Reacher book. Um, or at my latest thing, as you know, the last five or six years or so is, uh, is historical fiction. I, I'd love an Andrew Taylor book or a... Um, uh, an S.J. Paris or, a, or a, um, a C.J. Sampson. And I've discovered another one. This is a bit embarrassing, actually. I talked on air about how much I love historical fiction, particularly sort of 17th century stuff set around the time of Elizabeth and Mary and that just that period when we were all setting fire to each other for being the wrong kind of Christian. And I mentioned this and I got sent a book by a writer called S.W. Perry with a lovely note in it I'm pretty sure I'm remembering this correctly, saying that I used to be a producer at LBC and I write historical fiction un under this name. And for, for reasons I cannot recall, the book just sort of disappeared. It's, it's sort of, um, you know what, it, well, you probably don't because you don't get sent tons of books like I do, but, but I've got piles. And this one just disappeared to the bottom of a pile. And I was in Waterstones the other day looking for a new historical fiction to read, because I've read every book written by the authors I've just mentioned and others who I may have temporarily forgotten. And uh, Philip Kerr's good, yeah, but that's more modern. Um, and and I, I I saw this and I picked it up and I, and I read the, the blurb on the back of it, the first one in, 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 in the series. I bought it, I read it, and about halfway through I thought, this is the guy. And I went and I found one of my piles... And I had a bit of a rummage, and there it was, uh, the hardback, much later in the series. He'd sent me the fourth book in the series. Ages. So my apologies to S.W. Perry, whoever you are. Your books are absolutely brilliant. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm now well into the second in the series, and of course I've got the fourth or the fifth to, to, to look forward to because you gave it to me. You very kindly sent it to me, so my apologies for not picking up on that sooner. I I, the reason I love historical fiction is that you have all of the joys of a page-turner, historical crime fiction in particular. You have all of the joys of a page-turner, um, but also with the added bonus of, of learning stuff. So I've just read three novellas featuring Giordano Bruno, which is um, S.J. Paris's uh, ex-monk detective crossover and learning an awful lot about the the um the spanish inquisition in italy and the 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 oppression if you like of freedom of of thought and all of that um era and and religious oppression and tensions in the vatican and i think i met lucretia borgia in it as well although i don't think she was a borgia by the time there's all of that i love it i love it i love it and and um and yet, when lockdown came around, I, I couldn't do it. I don't know why. It just didn't happen. I could. I had, I had that weird... This is what Michael Morpurgo is talking about. My attention span. Something happened to my attention span. I'd get out of bed much later than usual, stroll down the garden to the shed, do the show, and come back. So I had more time on my hands than I've had since college or since unemployment. And I did very, very, very little. Well, I did write a book, actually, to be fair. Um, and then I did the terrible thing. I'll give you some advice, shall I, if you're ever thinking of becoming an author. Never publish a book when the bookshops are shut. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really strange experience to be public. That's why I've enjoyed the success of How They Broke Britain so much, because it's, it's come out in normal circumstances. The last one, How, How Not To Be Wrong, came out about a day before the second lockdown, if memory serves. It's very dispiriting to have a book out when there's no bookshops. Very dispiriting. And in fact, talking of how they broke Britain, it's 10 quid on Amazon today, which is practically half price. So if you haven't got yourself a copy of that yet or um, you want to buy it for the Brexiter in your life, then um, get yourself on there. 
uh, albeit that I prefer you to support your local bookshop, so I appreciate not everybody can afford to. So you're never going to get a better price than 10 quid for a, for a brand spanking new hardback that's now enjoying its 11th week in the Amazon Top 20. But I digress. Um, there's quite a few of you picking up on my use of the word piles, inclu- including the producer. Simon in Montrose writes, I'm sorry to hear you have piles, James. I sometimes think that I may not be the most childish contributor to this radio programme. It might be you, in fact, or e- even Keith. But I digress. This is a really important story, and you can never convey the urgency of this because it is such a, such a, a, a nebulous, malleable thing, the power of literature. It's, it's, you can't start shouting about it or screaming at people, you must read, but you can't hit people over the head. You can't argue them into picking up a book. You can't do it. It doesn't lend itself to that sort of tactic, you know? Um, and yet it is arguably the single biggest gift you could give to a child from, and, and the, the, the children being targeted by this uh, initiative are children from a, from low-income families. I think it's one of the most valuable gifts you could give to any child. But for a variety of reasons, a child from a low-income family is now much less likely to have access to books and reading activities than a child from a, from a higher-income family. Um, you can in it, 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 library there was a beautiful thing on twitter i don't know if you saw it i can't remember who it was even i think it was a writer in a library and there were three boys wandering around uh two a little older with, with, with probably the little brother of one of them and the little brother couldn't quite believe what they just told him and, and he said what you mean you can take the books home he said you mean you can take the books home and you don't have to pay and I have a vague memory of that feeling in Kidderminster Library in about 1978, 1979. I must have just, mum must have realised that I loved reading. And she t- and, and I, when you first go to a library and you realise that every single, if you've already got a love of books, you realise that every book in it, every story, all those kingdoms to discover, you can take them all home. I mean, you've got to bring them back. But you can tell it is actually magical, isn't it? And therefore, um, something over which the Tories have presided uh, over closures on, on unprecedented levels. But Michael Morpogo has identified this division of opportunity between children with access to books, um, whose lives and education were massively enriched as a consequence, and those from deprived backgrounds that did not. Now, I, I've got a couple of challenges for you this hour. I would really like you to explain to somebody who doesn't believe Michael Morpurgo why he's right. Now, I don't know how you're going to do that. You could do it from a position of pompous intellectualism, but I've probably got that covered. Certainly the pompous bit. Or you could do it from a position of personal perspective, which I think would be most powerful. So you, as a child of a low-income family, can explain how discovering literature... And, and these guys mean fiction. I, I appreciate that, you know, the first time you picked up an Andy McNabb, it was the only time you read a book and all the way to the end. That's no, no criticism of anybody, by the way, least of all Andy McNabb. But we're talking about children from low-income families and the books that are going to open doors and windows they didn't know existed are going to be storybooks. And... I want to know what happened to you, especially if you were from a poorer background. But for the rest of us, the challenge is is this. For the rest of us, the challenge is this. Explain to somebody who doesn't understand what Michael Morpurgo means. He says... We do have a hugely divided society, particularly at the moment when we have so many millions living in poverty, and these are the very children who are exposed to this lack of commitment to passing on what is arguably the greatest asset we have in this country, our literature, from this remarkable language we have got. He goes further. These are also the most likely children to be suffering from mental health issues, from lack of self-worth and from family problems at home. These are the very children who most need to find the pathway to fulfilment and achievement that books can bring. So either using your personal example or your insights 
just explain why books can save your life. 0345 6060 and, and explain to me, if you can, the difference that it has made to you. That, that I, I, what would you be? And I, I, don't, I don't think I need to apologize to people who don't read books. I, I, don't, I don't want you to feel alienated or people who don't read fiction. I, I, I just, I don't want you, you, you don't feel alienated. You don't, you don't, you're not necessarily missing out on anything, but I can't imagine a life without books. And, and therefore, I want you to tell me the difference that they make. 0345 6060 is the number that you need. Especially, especially if you were from a poorer background, if you are one of the children, or you, I beg your pardon, if you were one of the children that Michael Morpurgo is talking about, can you describe the difference that books made to you? And of course, the more you read, the better you'll be at describing things. That's, that's one of the bonuses, isn't it? That's one of the details. The number you need, as always, is 0345 6060 973. Because um, it's so important. Do you know that Dolly Parton is personally responsible for ensuring... Is it every child in America, I think? Or, or, or a huge numbers of children in America just get sent a book? One book. So what an amazing charity. What an amazing woman. I'd love to have her on full disclosure. Do you know, I got the weirdest phone call once on a Saturday from, an, from a mate who was with Dolly Parton's manager. And they'd heard the show in the car from Heathrow or something like that and the previous day and wanted to invite me to her concert that night. And I, I was in Norfolk. I was miles away. I was kicking myself. I'd have loved to. It would have been magical, wouldn't it? But she, she, she has done that. I, 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 you know, if, when I hang up my headphones, if I do find a cause to which I can dedicate myself and I'll be still badgering you for help and support, I can guarantee you, I, I can't think of anything that I might be better at than trying to get more books to more children who haven't got books in the first place. So, go on. 0345 is the number you need. What difference did it make to you? And, um... How can you explain that to a cynic? I don't mean a bad person. I just mean a sceptical one. Oh, whatever. No, it doesn't. What's old more Pergo banging on about now? But you know what he's banging on about. You know the difference it can make. Can you describe it? James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 22 after 12 is the time. And, um, and, and I, I, look, I'm very middle class. I, I, you know that, all right? And I, and I mention it because if I don't, you give me a hard time for not mentioning it. And when I mention it, you give me a hard time for mentioning it. But I've, I, I take a view. It's, it's, I don't know why the... I mean, I know the obvious answers to the questions of why children from poorer backgrounds are less likely to have access to books, but, but I don't know what difference, how, how different it feels to have those kingdoms of the imagination thrown open by books when you're from a poorer background. And I want you to tell me. Steve's in Luth in Lincolnshire to kick things off. Steve, what would you like to say? Uh, good afternoon, James. Hello, yeah, um, my name's Steve. I'm from Louth, actually, in Lincolnshire. Uh, Louth. Um, I said Luth. I, yeah. I'm a silly you old did, so yeah, Sorry, mate. Yeah, I, knew, I even right, knew yeah. that one, actually, but yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. Anyway. Next time I see you in North Berwick, I'll be pointing that out. It's loud. Quite right, right, too. Quite right, yeah. too. Yeah. Um, so when I was a kid, I was born in the 50s, and we had nothing, you know, nothing. I mean, nothing. Church mice used to come around and help us out. You know? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> get on with it. A fork in the sugar and, bowl. Yeah, yeah. and uh, no, we didn't have no sugar. <laughs> and, um, and my mother was, you know, we didn't have anything. My dad wasn't able to work, lots of stuff like that. And a guy came around selling encyclopedias. I had six brothers and sisters, you know, my mum and dad were okay at that. And, um, and this guy came around and sold this, this encyclopedia set. And my mother, I don't think ever paid for it. Mm. But as a five year old, I, I gathered the, the, these books were just a, they were a possession. They were so tactile, yeah. but B I got into reading them and, and the stories of, you know, it was Janet and John understand the weather. Janet and John understand loads. Janet and John, you know, go on a trip. Janet and John go on a train. And all of a sudden, I was able to get into a world that I never, ever inhabited. You know, like we never went on holidays, so we never went on 
trains or buses. You know, it was rough, you know. Yes. But, you know, we, there was always... And, and that, like, the escapism allowed me to get to a different place, allowed me to start thinking that there was a different world out there, allowed me to understand that there were people out there who didn't inhabit the world that I did. You know, yes. with some quite violent opportunity, you know, violent stuff as well, which right. is, you know, blah, blah, blah. But sure. I just think it opened up an avenue that I didn't know existed. It opened up opportunity. And I, I, I went to school. I was, I was brilliant at school, got me 11 plus, and then just got fed up with school, left when I was 14, got right. a job. I now have a, I have a bachelor's degree, I have a master's degree, I, I was at Sellafield Plant for three, year, three and a half years and ran part of that, and you know, I, I, I've moved on, and it was only, only through books. Well, so, I, I don't think either of us can answer this question, hmm. but who would we be if we hadn't had them? I don't know. I, I, it's a really good question. I mean, I was well, it's not, is it? It's a rubbish question because neither of us can answer it. But it's, <laughs> but it's a good in the sense yeah, that I, it makes no, you I, think. It's yeah, a good question. Yeah, I don't know. And I, you know, we've often talked about nature and nurture in our family because because yeah. my my siblings are not in the position that I'm in. I mean, right. I married somebody really good that helped me tremendously and that, and, and that encouraged me. And the other thing was, I had four children and I absolutely made sure all those children got the best education that they could, yeah. you know. So, so for me, that was really powerful. It taught you huge lessons. Where would you be without it? I don't know. But, well, but you know, I if, just think it was put it in a sentence, I, I think you've already done it, actually, Steve. It, it, mm. it, 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 it makes you aware of worlds beyond your window, doesn't it? It, 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 it made you yeah. realise that... Yeah. that yeah, there was something else out there, and I wanted to. I wanted to travel and see exotic things. I went on. I went on a trip. Oh, this is going to sound really strange. I went on a trip in, 19, in 2016 on the Murray River in Australia yeah. for five days, a bird watching thing, because I'd seen it in the book. Oh, how magical! When I was five. How Just, magical! What was yeah. what was it? Was it wasn't the children's encyclopedia? What, what? No, it was. Uh, it was. I can't remember that. It wasn't encyclopedia Britannica, but it was. No. It was a whole range of things. And the thing is, here I am, sixty-five years later, and I still have two of them. I That's still have magic, two. isn't it? I think we've got. Yeah. We, we had the children's encyclopedia, but I, I always remember called Arthur Me, M W E. I bet mum's. I bet it's in the attic at mum's, and I had I had a very similar experience to you actually, albeit that there were plenty of books in my house, and and and, and times were not hard. The the, the they did they, 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 I mean not fiction, but written like stories. So teaching you stuff through narrative, if you like, but not not fiction. God, what a lovely call. Thank you, mate. Uh, loose, loose, loose. I must remember that. And also, I must get back to North Berwick this summer. I didn't make it this year. Uh, last year, Lee's in Carshalton. Lee, what would you like to say? Yeah, hello, James. Hello, mate. Um, first time caller. Welcome uh, aboard. Hiya. Yeah, I was just ringing up because, um, well, uh, about 18 months ago, <clears throat> I gave up drinking, and one of the main things that got me through it has been reading books uh, in the evening. I just can't wait to sit down and read. Oh, wow. <clears throat> so it, it just, I mean, I, I was, yeah, you know, I used to drink so, so much all the time. And I did used to read a bit. Yeah. And I thought, well, I've got, and, I, and when I gave up drinking, I gave up through reading a book about drinking. Did you? Um, <laughs> yes. Um, I read a book about it and I thought, oh my God. Um, so, I, yeah, I thought, I'm going to stop this. And I sort of thought, right, I'm going to start reading more and more. And it's just been a life changer for me, really, because I just love reading now. I suppose and if you is. were if you were drinking to, to, to escape a bit. Yes. You, then, yes, then, probably. Then, then the books have stepped into that space. Yes, yes, and it gives me something to do. Uh, my wife, I can't wait to go to bed at night and read. I'm like, oh, we're going to go to bed now, so I'll come read me book. <laughs> <laughs> when you've I got a really, really, when you've got a really good one on the go, there's yes. nothing like it, is there? There's no, I mean, you, yeah. can't, you can't. Oh, I can't. Just one more chapter before I turn the lights off. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and also, like, you know, so I, mean, I like C.J. Sampson and stuff like that. You know, um, yes. historical fictions. And yes, so well, check uh, yes, out. Check, so, have you read the S.J. Paris ones or the S.W. Well, Perry I, ones? I've just got one actually, and I, I haven't started reading it yet because I'm just finish, finishing off a book. But is, oh, is well, you'll it, enjoy is, that. Yeah, I've just actually got that to start reading when I finish yeah. the one I've got now. They're, they're my, so they're yes, my, no, that's good for me. But yeah, and that's not childhood. That's that's but that's in adulthood for someone who did read. But you found a whole new gear since you gave up yes. the booze. Yeah. I bet you're healthy so, yeah. for it as well, aren't you? Definitely, yeah. Oh, I love definitely. that, Lee. Thank you, mate. Um, <laughs> oh, I, James. Did you say, say again? 
So that's a Tuesday. No, mind, mind how you go. It just faded in my ear then. Tw- 29 minutes after 12 is the time. In fact, it does exist in Britain, Dolly Parton's Imagination Library. Um, they've already mailed 5 million mailed. Posted, Dolly, posted. They've, <laughs> they've mailed 5 million books to children in the UK and, and that the system is up and running. Um, she launched it in 2007. It's a book gifting program, more Americanese. It's a book gifting program devoted to inspiring a loving a love of reading in the hearts of children everywhere. Um, so it, it, it is exactly what I say. Uh, the, the support, the books of a appropriate, high quality uh, are sent to children every month from birth until the month they turn five. Uh, I I don't know any more about it except that, but I do know now that it is operating in the UK as well. Half past 12, Amelia Cox has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 33 minutes after 12 is the time. It's Dolly Parton's birthday today, would you believe? Her 78th birthday. So, highly unlikely event that anybody listening to this is going to be bumping into her later to make sure she knows that we were lavishing love upon her on uh, on the programme. Um, Michael Mopogo, other authors, passionate about the importance of getting books into the lives of children from from poorer backgrounds, from from low-income families. And I think we've done a pretty good job so far of explaining why it is important, because not everybody gets it. Not everybody gets it. And um, and and it, it is it is the greatest gift you can give someone. And, and it, however old you are, I'll read this. It's, uh, you, you, hi, James, it's anonymous here. <laughs> I just wanted to say that in all my 52 years, I've never read a book from cover to cover. I've read books or tried to read books but I've never finished them my, my imagination would finish the book in the way that I wanted I even managed to get through school doing the same you're the first person that I've ever told this to I've got a successful I've had a successful career and business life but I now feel like I've missed out on so much I've never felt this until you're phoning today but I but I don't feel the urge to read a book <laughs> no, it's not for everybody I mean to be honest if, if you're a finishing the books yourself in your head then you've got no you, you've got it the imagination is there it's the it's the it's, i don't know it's 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 the it's like a, you know how your outer life needs nourishing like you need food and you need stimulation you need sunlight and oxygen and water i think your inner life needs nourishing as well and it doesn't necessarily all come from from books some some of the rpg games some of the big Video games, they, 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 they are like interactive fiction, aren't they? That, that is as if you are playing a character in a story and they are written incredibly well. I think Alex Garland worked on video games as well as films. The guy that wrote The Beach and wrote the script for 28 Days Later, he moved into video. So some brilliant writers and artists working on video games. But, but it, 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 I guess the pictures are better. I like to say pictures are better on the radio because you use your imagination to create them. And I, and I think when you're reading a book, there'd be moments, haven't there, with books, where five years later you can't remember whether you read it or saw it. And then you, you work it out and you realise, well, you know you couldn't have seen it because it's never been filmed, but in your head you're sure you saw it. I used to get that a bit when I was younger, not so much now. Um, 12.36 is the time. Ashling's in Surbiton. Ashling, what would you like to say? Oh, hello. Sorry, I'm, re- I'm really nervous. First time caller. It's only and, me. Uh, very it's long only, time. It's only me. I, you always say that, but we know I, that's not true. No, it um, is definitely only me, but it's not necessarily a guarantee that you don't need anything to be nervous about. Carry on. Um, I, just, I just wanted to call in because I was listening to this particular subject and um, it really sort of resonates with me. I, I grew up in a... Well, my parents were probably working class, but we, they were aspirational and we grew up in a middle class area. Yeah. Um, but we didn't have a lot of money, um, but I did have access to books. Um, and they were always like the most important thing in my world. Um, and we were a, quite a dysfunctional family, right. so it wasn't the worst thing you can imagine, but it was not great. Okay. Um, and so looking back now, I realise that, that books basically kind of brought me up, mm. that the, the books I was reading sort of helped me understand how to be a person and how, you know, how families should work, how society should work, what Gosh. was... What was kind of not missing in where where I was. Is that your animal? Um, yeah, sorry. No, that's lovely. I'm just checking. I just wanted to make sure you weren't under attack. No, I'm not under attack. How lovely. That's yeah. I'd never thought of it like that, actually, because I'm I'm thinking about 
escapism reading books, you're in a sense describing learning how the world should be. Yeah, yeah. And it's I different. think escapism was a huge part as well. Sure. And I, I did live in my books and it was my way of retreating to a safe place. But, yeah. um, you know, I didn't really get the sort of, or I felt, you know, looking back, yeah. we, we didn't really get the kind of upbringing that we needed. We weren't, we weren't set up to, to, to be out in the world and, and books gave that to me. Uh, they sort of brought me up, basically. They socialised me and... Um, and and gave me hope for what you know oh, what could beautiful. actually be. Uh, but particular books you can cite as oh, having had well, a, a been, a, having made you the woman that you are today. Actually. It's hard. It's hard to kind of think of them as being particularly special. But things like just like Little House on the Prairie or what Casey did or mm. um, Children from One End Street, I think was a favourite of mine. The Kids from One End Street or something. I don't and know that one. Um, uh, oh. It's I can't remember the name. The, 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 the Little House on the Prairie is, I mean, we should probably make a list one day of the truly seminal books that people read as children. That 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 yeah. touches so many people forever, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And and Little Women and things like that. And I know, that, know they're kind of sentimental books in a way. Sure. Um, uh, you know, they're of their time. But, um, yeah. But you need sentiment when you're little. You it's like a warm you blanket do. being wrapped around you, isn't it? Some of those exactly. stories that, that are like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. You're not sounding nervous now. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Have a lovely weekend. Thank you, Ashley. It's 12.39. This is nice. I love it when this happens. The power of radio. Uh, I think the books that your last caller spoke of, that would be Stephen Luth, definitely not Louth, uh, were called The New Book of Knowledge, James. I'm pretty sure my mum bought them from a salesman at the door and paid weekly. My brother and I frequently consulted them throughout school and they came with me when I left home over 50 years ago. I still have the set. Um, that's nice. And speaking of Andy McNabb, he's written a brilliant series of books, uh, Pete tells me, called uh, Boy Soldier. Um, for nine to thirteen year old boys, they're, they're an excellent read for for for, 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 for youngsters. So it's Hugh, sorry. Uh, Sarah's in Seven Oaks. Sarah, what would you like to say? Can I just say this is such an interesting and exciting topic for me? So thank you so much. I'm trying to study and I keep getting distracted by you. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't blame me if your essays are late. <laughs> oh no, it's not an essay; it's a PhD. So, okay. well, you, you definitely, well, you definitely can't blame me then. Go on. No, okay. Um, First of all, I grew up in in the middle class area, but poor. So yeah. for me, going to uh, my local library in Seven Oaks, that uh, some of the most magical memories for me as a kid. You know, we didn't have a lot, but mm. that was it. And, and I still go there to this day. And, and every time I go in, I go, oh, I used to come here as a kid. It's brilliant. Um, why? That, why? Why? What difference did it make? What did it do? It uh, gave me a sense of community. And How do you it, mean? How can you get a sense of community from having your head in a book? What? What by going to a library and realise there's you, other people there who yeah. are just as fascinated by books as you? And it, did you do things there? Because I, I remember a storytelling group now at Kidderminster Library that I'd forgotten about. That you'd go to after school and someone would just read you a story, which is a lot. I mean, Mum and Dad read us stories as well, but that just took it to a new dimension. Well, not as a child, but no. as an adult, um, I went to a local. A reading group for mental health for people oh, who were struggling. What a great idea. And that's had, had, had a great um, effect on me. And that got me back into reading. And now I'm a complete book nerd. I've got so many books, it's ridiculous. Um, I also find, I, 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 know, I understand that you talk about literature a lot, but mm. I find reading biographies, especially of celebrities and their mental health, has helped me to accept who I am. Um, accept my struggles and uh, become a stronger person for it as well. But you but feel seen. Believe. You feel seen. You feel. I feel seen and yes. understood, of and course. that's. Uh, you, I I don't get that in society. You know, I'm an introvert, and I find it a bit tricky to sure. uh, navigate my world. Yes. You know, with yes. um, ADHD and dyslexia. Yes, so, of course. Um, but I also think you can get that from literature as well. You know, people say, write about what you know. And a lot of people who write literature put their own aspects of life into it. So you can learn from both. It's so powerful, James. You're very true. I didn't mean to be snobbish about non-fiction. I mean, crikey, I've been plugging <laughs> my own non-fiction book since November the 2nd of last year. But but I think it, for, for children... Um, the, yeah. the, 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 the world's outside your window. Well, probably not even that, actually, Sarah, now you come to mention it. You could probably be reading a story as a child about someone you really admire or about yeah. Anne Frank's diary, I suppose. Or you, it doesn't have absolutely. to be fiction at all, it's, does it? It's absolutely amazing. And there's a lot more books about 
neuro um diversity now um people who are neurodivergent and i think that would have helped me so much as a kid well have you I, read i, I really do. do have you heard of percy jackson yes you know that 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 um rick riordan's huge series actually takes neurodivergence as a starting point for superpowers so it's it's all about mm. it's all about mount olympus and zeus and the gods but yeah. the, but the but the but the but the kids in the modern world who who have the links with the ancients yeah. uh, are are neurodiverse and and it's mm. as if that because you are related to a because you are an immortal and you're related to a god it presents in the modern world as being neurodiverse it's an incredible yeah. conceit yeah. for an author to have introduced it's exactly what you're talking about yeah so yeah books books are amazing but, and, um, and, and and here you are doing a phd so something yeah. stuck well, exactly. I've just been reading about feminist disability studies while um, listening to your show. So, I think most people um, do, Sarah. <laughs> normal. <laughs> yes, it's, 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 it's probably the most topic, most popular topic of, uh, of, 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 of. I wish you well. PhDs are tough, man, but you know that already. Twelve forty-four is the time. Kathy's in Bermondsey. Kathy, what would you like to say? Hi. Yeah. Um, you, the Dolly Parton Library. Go yes. online. Um, they will. It will come up. Uh, put in your postcode, and if you're under that scheme, you you just register the child and the uh, address. It's great, isn't and it? And you, it just that's it. That is all. I mean, my grandson. Uh, yeah, he loved his books. You signed him up for uh, it, did you? Yes, oh. and now I have to supply him every month with another book. Quite right. Too. That's what grandmas um, are for. <laughs> but yeah, it just um, the difference it made to my life. I can I was a street child. You know, one of those. Yeah, never got home and, yeah, was out all night, that type of thing. Oh, okay. And, Crikey. Uh, yeah, no, my father was illiterate right. and it was, it was an interesting childhood. <laughs> but um, I used to go to the library to keep warm. Yeah. You had to stamp your feet to make sure the rats weren't running around Ooh. to get in there. It, yeah, no, it's an, it's, 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 Bermondsey's changed. Yes, it certainly um, has. <laughs> it's been gentrified, don't you know? Oh, isn't it, Jeff? <laughs> but, um, so, but that library, I mean, it was... It was Pure, uh, just completely absorbed me. And then I, I was saying to your researcher, producer, whatever, that... Um, I well, I like whatever. It, well, can we introduce well, that now, can, moving forward? Can everyone say, I was talking to your whatever? <laughs> well, this My is producer. where comes in at useful, Well, that's it? very true. Words. Yes, exactly. A dizzying but, array. Well, Go on. Uh, whenever now, I, what happened is, is that was through childhood. I then got married. When I was getting divorced, it was very, very stressful. Oh. I retreated again into my books. Oh, really? Um, but now I'm retired and I love my life. I've got Audible on all the time or LBC. Mm. So I'm still, I, I mean, I've listened to yours. It's amazing. Oh, you're very kind. Thank you. <laughs> no, you can honestly, come again. Yeah. It's all right. It doesn't exactly but, cheer you up though, does it? No, but it puts it all, because I'm also dyslexic. So right. It puts it in order for me. Ah, uh, yeah. So, so I, so I'm listening to that while I'm sewing and I'm, so although I'm not sitting and reading, mm. I've got it going in my head all the time. And, reading to my children. I mean, I taught for 35 years and I would have magazines, I would have comics, you know, newspapers. What, I didn't care what they read. I no. just wanted them to read. And it worked? It, it certainly did. I used to read stories to my kids when they went to bed. My son didn't like stories, so I used to read in wrestling magazines. Yeah, I, I think, I think really? there's a, you've got, you find what you like, don't you? There's no point Definitely. trying to prescribe. You, you, you help. The biggest gift you can give a child is helping them find the stuff they Completely, like to read. Absolutely, yeah. I wasn't, as a teacher, they didn't like it because it's like, no, this is what we're reading yeah. this week. And it's like, well, he's not listening. He's I'm not, not going to read that. He's not going to yeah. read that. And Audible's gone bonkers in the last few years. So, so oh, the, it's the, but loads of people prefer their books now in in audio format. I don't, I yeah. don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's any downside to that, is there? I just you, you no, you no. Can rewind. It's like Global Player. You can rewind it and pause it and pick it yeah. up again and go back. And, and you can do things while it's going on. But yes, you can sew. You can cook. You can you can do whatever. God, I got you on the can rowing machine. Walking. I used to get on the rowing oh, machine during yeah. lockdown on that, and because I get so bored doing exercise, I yeah. need to get back into that. Actually, I need to, yeah, there no, you go. I've You've inspired me. Yeah, as well. When so, were you yeah. last on it? When were you last on it? I just moved it when I overed. <laughs> <laughs> Have a lovely day, Kathy. <laughs> well, that'll do. That counts, doesn't it? That's weightlifting. It's twelve forty-seven. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC.
It's 12.51. I knit it all together now in quite a spectacular fashion because the power of radio, which I've mentioned this morning, the importance of books, and uh, you're about to hear from someone who has written a book, and indeed the growing popularity of podcasts that, in a sense, straddle the space between books and radio, don't they? In, in a way, in a sense. So the guest on Full Disclosure this week is a journalist called Nick Wallace, who you've probably heard of. If you haven't, you have. Because he is the journalist who has, arguably, but I, I think I would win that argument, done more than any other to propel the post office scandal to the prominence that it finally achieved at the uh, at the beginning of this year. Indeed, he, he worked on the drama, Mr. Bates versus the post office. And, and back in the day, he, he took the story to Richard Brooks at Private Eye. Richard joined us, of course a couple of weeks ago to, to talk through the early days of that. But what I didn't know until I met Nick earlier this week was how his interest in the story had actually begun because he is one of those people like me who loves radio and has worked in radio and will hopefully work in radio again. And it was when he was presenting a show on a radio station that he got a text. And, and from that little acorn, the whole oak tree of the Horizon scandal, the post office scandal, the ITV drama, the continuing political uproar, um, and, and of course the countless, almost countless human tragedies that, that have unfolded. It was from that tiny acorn of a text to his radio show that the whole thing grew, which certainly gave me pause. I thought of, of, of the occasions when you've sent me a text that says something like, James, I've got something really important for you to look into and, I, and I've, I've not explored it for maybe I've missed several scoops over the years. It seems possible, but thankfully, Nick was built of rather better journalistic um, uh, clout than I am, and and he tells a little bit of the story here. I was actively looking for stories all the time at BBC Surrey. That's what Newsbeat had taught me. Mm. Go and look for where the stories are, and you can't just expect them to come to you. And I got a, a text from a company called Surrey Cars asking if they could bid for the BBC Surrey taxi account. Now, of course... It immediately chuckled as soon as I saw it because the idea that we'd have a budget for a yeah. taxi account made me laugh. And if if we did, I would have forwarded the tweet mm. on to management and thought no more about it. But I said so, I was on air at the time, and I jealously guarded the BBC Surrey Twitter account. So I'd come from ra that that London and Radio yeah. One using Twitter, and I, and we didn't have a Twitter account at BBC Surrey. So I was saying, oh, you know, it's the future. I mean, people are, people are going to use this Twitter thing. It's great. You know, tr trust me. Let me show you how it works. I got permission to set up the official BBC Surrey Twitter account, and I used to sort of jealously guard it to see yeah, how many yeah, yeah. new followers we'd got and what tweets were coming in. So I was on air doing the breakfast show, and the uh, the tweet came in. And because you, you tend to be slightly adrenalised when you're when you're when you're doing a, a show, and I, mm. and I think I might have said instead of just saying I'm sorry, we don't have a taxi account, I said yeah. something like. All that depends whether your drivers will come on air and tell us some of their amazing stories, mm. or words to that effect. And I got a tweet back saying, oh, I've got a story to tell you, all right. Call me after the show. I thought, just something about the tone of it. And I thought, well, okay, he's offering me a story. Great, yeah. I will call him after the show. I'm not doing anything else. So uh, we private message, followed each other, private message, swap numbers. After the show, I, I gave this person a call. And Surrey Cars was one man. It was Davinda Misra. Right who was the wife of Seema Misra, who was the West, or formerly was the West Byfleet sub postmistress, and he told me that, that his, his pregnant partner had been thrown in prison for a crime she didn't commit. And I was agog. But I was mass, and he, you know, his story, you push him, you ask questions, you ask all the right questions you should, and we were on the phone for 40 minutes, and he was, he was, he was erratic, but lucid. He mm. was all over the place. You could tell he was traumatized. Yeah. He was not someone who I thought was spinning me a yarn. But the, the, the best thing for me about this was that he referred me to the 2009 Computer Weekly investigation, which was already in the public domain. Yes. And he told me there was an organisation called the Justice for Sub-Postmasters Alliance run by one Alan Bates. So within an hour of putting the phone down to Devinda, I was speaking to Alan Bates, who told me, oh, yeah, there are loads of people out there who've had exactly or a similar experience to what Devinda and Seema had gone through. And... You'd never done a job like this before. You'd never... No, you'd, no, no. no. You'd never, I'd never done an investigation. Never gone deep. No, 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 no. And, and I, I love the way that cuts off there because that you want to hear more, don't you? And you can. Uh, you can download Full Disclosure at Global Player or, or indeed wherever you get your podcasts. And it, it's, it's, it's a 
perfect accompaniment or, or companion piece to to the drama, actually. And, and Nick's book, The Great Post Office Scandal, steers us effortlessly back to the conversation that we've been having since 12 o'clock, which is about Michael Morpurgo's call to arms. And as I say, I saw him speaking yesterday, and uh, I'm not, not embarrassed to tell you that I shed a little tear on at least two occasions. Once when he did, actually, he was commemorating or remembering a teacher he'd had, a classics teacher he'd had at school who had fled the Nazis um, and, and ended up here and gave, gave well, all of the people that contributed to Michael Morpurgo's lifelong love of books, I think, explain why he is so dedicated and, and, and passionate about ensuring that other children, in this case, children from lower income backgrounds, have the same access. And we've just been chronicling. If you don't like me and you're just tuning in to listen to Sheila, I, I'll just tell you that we've been chronicling, chronicling the difference that that books can make in your life, um, particularly if you're having a, having a tough childhood. You may not even realise it's a tough childhood. Kim's in Hampstead. Kim, what would you like to say? Hello, Jane. Hello, Kim. I've spoken to you before. I listen to you every morning. Thank you. Quite right, um, too. Should be compulsory. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, basically, I spent a lot of my childhood in hospital um, right. from the age of two up until 13, Good. in and out different operations for uh, my hips, this form of dislocated hips. Right. So I was given books to read, and um, some of those books were Enid Blyton, you know, The um, Adventurous Five, and uh, The Mystery. The Famous Five. The, the Famous, famous five. five. You've misnamed yeah. them. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't famous then, you should have said. They weren't famous then, James. No one had heard of them. <laughs> they were still just adventurous. <laughs> no, the, I love The Famous Five and The Secret Seven. And the, I, I, I like The Magic right. Faraway Tree before I got onto The Famous Five with Moonface and, and Silky what? and The Saucepan Man. Well, it was a long time ago because I'm yes. 64 now. Crikey, crikey. And, and what, what, what would have happened if you hadn't? I mean, because you get bored, presumably, right. a lot going in and out. Yeah. Of. So so what happened was, um, after reading those books, I, at, at the age of 17, alone, took myself off on an adventure and went to live in Italy, met up with an Algerian girl, and we ended up hitchhiking um, from Italy across to North Africa, Crikey. And we hitch, we hitchhiked through Tunisia, through Algeria, through Morocco. Um, then we went into Spain, Portugal, Spain, France, and I came back to England. And that journey and those adventures really came, be, you know, from those books that I knew could change life. Wow. And I ended up about seven years ago, I wrote my own book about that journey and it's called The Adventurous Spirit, Walking Between Two Worlds. And it's available on Amazon. <laughs> That's a bit cheeky. But given that I p plug my own book so mercilessly on the programme, I can hardly tell you off, Kim, for doing the same. I have my name, though. No, I, I, well, go on, then. So it's Kim Alexis. There we go. Um, and, uh, yeah. And, and it's available and now on Amazon. It if you is. want to find out more, I'm surprised I couldn't remember stuff from that long ago. But I'd go, well done. That's a lovely story as well. Because I, I guess every writer actually started off as a reader, almost ever, presumably. And, and without the reading, you never would have got on to the writing. Thank you, Kim. I am at genuinely out of time. That's why we crack on. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back to the whole show podcast on Global Player, where you can pause and rewind live radio. You'll find all of LBC's shows to catch up on, as well as the world's biggest podcasts, including full disclosure. Um, do pause and rewind live radio on Global Player. Uh, get it from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick, but now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. Thank you, James. James O'Brien on LBC.